Call to order the uh, Tuesday, October 2nd meeting of the Court of Madera Town Council. Uh, roll call. Councilmember Bailey. Here. Councilmember Beckman. Here. Councilmember Coonhart. Here. Vice Mayor Andrews. Present. Mayor Bailey. Er, Mayor Provasio, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Here. Can we start over? <laughs> uh, can you join me in the salute to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, my chair. Okay. Uh, we had a closed session meeting uh, before this meeting. We took no reportable action, but we have given direction to staff and the town attorney. Uh, we now move on to open time for public comment. This is for items that are not on the agenda. If you wish to speak, uh, please limit your comments to three minutes. If you want to talk about something that is not on the agenda, you can get over there to the microphone and go ahead and do that. Anybody want to do that? And if you can give your name and ad uh, address, please, that'd be great. Roy Wolford. 37 C Wolf Passage. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, I can hear it. Uh, I want to encourage uh, all council members, and I know uh, two of you have uh, read my emails from yesterday and today. Yesterday was uh, kind of a follow up uh, on the Marsh issue on an email that I had sent last year in 2007, and I've spoken with bridge board members and uh, uh, other people at the board about the marsh and uh, I know that's an issue later on so I'll hold all the remarks on that for that, uh, that time period. Uh, the other email I sent was just today, it was uh, this afternoon and it was on uh, the sewer levels. Okay, so uh, I'm not particularly and my wife's not particularly happy with the, the uh, council and the town uh, uh, setting us up as the owners of a complete sewer lateral. Uh, I've sent you a diagram from Redwood City uh, that is very clear, and I think it's fair, it's a private and public partnership where the homeowners are responsible for the sewer under their property, but beyond the property, the city is responsible for it, and that's also San Mateo County. I think that's a fair way to do it. We have no control over what happens beyond our property line, and it is not fair to make somebody responsible for something they have no control over. So I would appreciate it if you reconsider that lateral. And uh, as I had uh, noted uh, in an August address that my wife and I made to the council, uh, we've paid for that. There, there, back in 2005, we were promised that the, the town would pay for the laterals and the inspections. You yeah, have, uh, I think, $11 million uh, uh, available to spend. I think it should be spent. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak at open time? Bob, can I just say one thing with that? Uh, I know we can't comment yes, on it. we cannot, but go ahead. Okay, so, um, Roy, we can't, as leader. you probably know, we can't comment on a topic you bring up at open time, but it's not on the agenda. But you should know that we do read everything we're given, and we appreciate the thoughtfulness of your emails. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? No? Okay, then we're going to move on to presentations. Update regarding Proposition 6, a voter initiative to repeal Senate Bill 1, transportation funding. Mm -hmm. Presentation by town staff, RJ. Uh, Mayor Vazio, I'm just gonna give a few introductory remarks. RJ will give the presentation. Uh, I just want the council and particularly the, the citizenry of uh, Corte Madera to understand that <clears throat> your public works department uh, takes the possibility of Proposition 6 passing uh, with uh, great uh, gravity and severity. Uh, we believe that it would be a very bad thing to happen in the state of California. Um, RJ will go over the details of that. But just so that everyone knows, if you speak with your constituents or if you speak with people who vote in town, uh, this, this basically repeals the um, fuel tax that was enacted in November. Uh, and it was the first time we had raised uh, fuel tax and created new revenue for our transportation system in about 
since 1993, 1994. I don't know if any of you are living on the same income that you had in 1993 or 94. It's very difficult to do. Uh, the transportation system has been limping along on revenues that were set at that time. And so RJ's got about 10 slides. He's going to give you some of the details um, with a look at Marin and Corte Madera. Uh, but the message from the Public Works Department is um, talk to the folks you know uh, and let them know that um, if this is to pass, there will be what I would call severe consequences for the state. Thank you, Peter. All right, thank you very much. Give them the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have this problem frequently. Does the mouse work? Uh, oh, there we go. Oops. Mouse works. Okay. Don't worry. Yeah. Successively well. Got it. Just down. For want of a nail. So yeah, thank you, um, RJ Suko, senior engineer, in public works. Um, spent the last 10 years uh, playing a large role working for the county on their road program, and I've been tasked here to do the same thing for uh, the town of Corte Madera. So here are a couple bullets on um, some of the impacts that repealing um, SB1 would have on the town and the Bay Area. Uh, reduction of funding by the state and about 48 um, percent this is significant funding used for uh, repairing roads um, pedestrian safety transit um, you know as you can see 390 million dollars per year in new funding for the bay area Next slide. Um, statewide it's about five billion dollars per year and um, funds are roughly split, split split excuse me between the state and local agencies and again the focus is um, public transit, uh, roads, and um, safety projects. Just kind of an image of, you know, some of the things we see around um, the town and the area. Uh, I think you've all seen a, a poor roadway from time to time, and obviously here are um, some of the transit facilities we use, um, and, you know, obviously safety improvements. So this is a graph showing the historical gasoline excise tax um, adjusted for inflation. And so what we're trying to show here um, is really, um, so SP1 was able to show a spike and improve um, the funding for local agencies in the state. But at the same time, it really doesn't get us, you know, at the peak or on par with, you know, some of the funding that was once dedicated to roads and the infrastructure. We're really on par circa with, you know, 1920, 1930 levels. Next slide. So this graph is a um, kind of your standard pavement condition deterioration curve. So pavement condition is typically rated on a zero to 100 scale. It starts out on a brand new road at 100, and over time it decreases to zero. Um, typical design life is about 20 years. And so the, the network for Corte Madera is right here, right about 68. Just so happens the Bay Area is right around 67. And what's worth pointing out is the curve here between, you know, your 60 range or 50 range, it, it dives sharply, you know, over a short amount of time. And um, the cost to bring those roads up to new condition is quite substantial. You know, if you pick it off here as opposed to a few years prior there, and really you're talking about thinner lifts of asphalt, you know, you're not having to do as deep of repairs or as widespread of repairs. So, um, you know, we always try to keep our good roads good, and that's the model that, um, you know, they show is the most um, beneficial financially. So this, um, this graph shows uh, the state funding um, with and without SB1. So the blue bars show um, the highway users um, highway users tax, we call it HUDA, and the orange bar shows the SB1 contribution. 
Um, so by about 2018, 19, it's almost double the funding um, with SB1 in place. And um, these minor increases are really just inflation. Um, so, you know, double is, is better, obviously, for, um, you know, the amount of funding we can put toward the infrastructure. <clears throat> um, this is a snapshot of the roads in Corte Madera. Um, green is a good road, red is poor, and you've got the two options in between. As you can see, you know, we do have a mixed bag. Um, certainly have some good roads, certainly have some that need some uh, repair. And, you know, this, this tax really helps us address those and, and keep our condition and our network um, high. What's the date of that? This is recent. This is um, within the last six months. I challenge one of them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this kind of goes into some metrics, you know, on the zero to 100 scale for the network, what happens with and without SB1 um, over the next 10 years. Um, so, you know, a difference of dropping from 68 to 60 um, versus 68 to 51. And, and again, that assumes that we're not contributing funds at a local level, but it just kind of isolates um, the investment and kind of what you would expect um, if we were solely relying on state funding. Uh, also, the overall deferred maintenance rises quite substantially over that period, $6.3 million to $25.7 million. So in addition to the allocated um, annual funding that, that the town would receive from SB1 fundings, they also have a grant program or several grant programs where you can apply for specific project funding. And Corte Madera has been successful in getting two projects up to date, uh, $200,000 for the Climate Adaptation Planning Grant, and also another $415,000 for design engineering of um, <clears throat> the Central Marin Regional Pathway Gap Closure Project, which is the one depicted here. And we'll look at um, adding bike ped facilities on Nellon and also um, looking at replacing or upgrading what's there on Warnham. So also, um, obviously, public transit is a large component of the funding. Um, just in next year alone, there's uh, potential for $200 million um, throughout the Bay Area to be in jeopardy if Prop 6 were to prevail. And um, whether you know we all use uh, public transit or not, we certainly are benef you know we benefit every time we get in our cars by you know potential reductions in traffic congestion. Um, and certainly there's there's a large part of the community that does rely on the public transit, so it's, it's a very important element also to be considered. Any questions? Any questions from the council? For our Thank you. David, did you have something? Go ahead. Is it only questions? Yes, it's only questions. <laughs> okay. Um, we're not really taking action on this. This is just a presentation, um, I, right? It it's on the consent calendar, right? But That's correct. And as a follow-up to this, there is an item on the consent calendar to oppose Prop 6. Um, the uh, Marin County Council and mayors and council members did support the opposition. Right. Uh, can we yes. allow okay. comments now so we don't interrupt the consent calendar? Um, just take it off consent. Yeah, I think we can do that. Why don't we see, are there any questions from the public for RJ? If you can, please come to the microphone and, again, give your name and... <coughs> Two quick questions. The presentation, is it available online? And two, uh, the map that had the condition of the roads in uh, Corte Madera, um, who prepared that? So we have copies of the pre presentation in paper form in the back. If you would like one to take home with you, um, I think we could put it online as well and um, definitely get the word out. Um, as for the map, um, I think it may have, did it show? Um, that one, uh, I believe it's, it's a bag. Um, do you know the acronym on that one? Yeah. Yeah. But right. So some of the data, um, when I say it's within active within the six months, it's the most recent data that's been inputted. Um, 
there's a chance. I think the last time we inputted may have actually been, you know, possibly a year ago. So the source is updated, but may lack some recent inputs. Okay. Did someone else have a question for RJ? Yes, if you could please come to the microphone. But we'll, we'll also be updating um, the network here by the end of the year as part of um, a PTAP grant that we have. Roy Wolford. Uh, question I have is uh, on the voter information pan, uh, guide, uh, there's some issues here. And, and the big issue with uh, SB1 is the state diverted funds that were supposed to be allocated to the roadways and that sort of thing and put it in the general fund and spent it elsewhere. So if you've read the voter information ballot, ballot uh, and I'd appreciate it if you'd comment on this, What's your response to this, okay? Uh, it's really a regressive tax. It hits the people with the lowest income the worst. And they're, they're saying here in the information ballot that it's gonna cost $500 per year for a family of four. Uh, for probably most of us, not a big deal. But for a lot of other folks uh, on a low income and a fixed income, it is a big deal. Uh, there was an 18% reduction in Caltrans funding over the last 10 years. Where did that money go? There's a $16 billion budget surplus. That money could be spent for the roadways in lieu of uh, SB1. So a whole bunch of other things. And also, this was a tax that was implemented without voter approval. So this Prop 6, is, as part of it, is going to require that there is voter approval on any such tax. So I'd like you to address those issues. I know we need the, the, the roadways fixed, but you've got to allocate the funds properly. Uh, Matt, or Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll take Please, those. Right uh, so in, in terms of uh, the beauty of democracy, everyone is certainly entitled to their, uh, their opinions. I don't think Public Works has any uh, specific comment on you know, how the legislation was passed. Um, our, our job is more to assess the impacts of the repeal. Um, and from maintaining the infrastructure of the transportation system, we believe that the impacts of the repeal will be significant. That's our only comment in terms of, um, you know, the politics of the proposition. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the it, public? And it passed by two-thirds of the legislature. And was signed by the governor. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to bring it back to the council now. So... <laughs> If the council would like to ask questions, because this is a consent calendar item, or have discussion, so yeah. anybody wanna, did anybody else get the mailing that I received today on this topic? It's a very informative mailing on uh, no on Prop Six, um, and I I'm not sure if anybody wants to have a look at that. Okay, thank you, thank you, RJ. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to our next presentation, update regarding Golden Gate Bridge District's four-acre tidal marsh restoration project. Uh, and this is from John Eberly. Eberly, yes. Good, thank you. <coughs> Deputy District Engineer, Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District. Okay. And again, this is a presentation. We're not taking any action on this. So uh, good evening. Uh, my name is John Eberly. I'm the Deputy District Engineer at the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, thank you for having us tonight. Um, with me tonight are a couple of people I'd like to introduce. Linford Edwards, Senior Engineer on the project. I also have George Salvaggio and Stephanie Freed. They're with WRA Incorporated, our consultants on the project and Priya Clemens, uh, Public Information Officer for the district. So as, uh, as you mentioned, this is an update on the district's uh, four-acre restoration project in Corte Madera. And a little bit of background history, the project purpose, the district has an obligation to restore four acres of tidal marsh um, within its, its property located in Corte Madera. These are the result of um, two actions. One is a Army Corps permit back in 1988 for disposal of dredge material, a dredging episode that occurred in the ferry, uh, Larkspur Ferry uh, Navigation Channel. 
And also in the 1990s, the district uh, first introduced high-speed ferries out of Larkspur. And as part of that, there was a, a settlement that the district entered into to restore two acres of marsh at this location for introducing those high-speed ferries. So we've been working on this project for a while. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the area, this is a large overview to show uh, where the property is at, it's outlined in red on here. That's a district's 42-acre parcel. To the east of that is the Corte Madero Marsh. That was a marsh that was established when the ferry terminal at Larkspur was actually constructed back in the 1970s, 1973. Um, and then you can see the Bay Trail and some, some other features there. And then there's a, a photo from the south looking uh, <coughs> northwest where you could see the marsh and then inside the marsh, you see the upland area. That's the district 72 acre parcel. And then here's just another aerial view. So again, the, the green band and uh, uh, green area is a 72 acre parcel. And then to the east, you can see the PG&E lines and, and the marsh and then the bay. Uh, to the west is uh, uh, Smart Right of Way and Shorebird Marsh. So one of the one of the big cons uh, concerns on this on this property and trying to establish a marsh here is we have a public access easement. So as part of the 1973 BCDC permit and its amendments, um, uh, one of the permit uh, requirements was to create a 10-foot wide uh, public access easement uh, around the eastern uh, side of the parcel. So I'll show you a picture of that later which uh, shows where that where that public access is so we um, we established that and we uh, actually transferred that uh, or we granted a deed uh, grant deed to the town in 1982 um, the public access easement uh, is not a part of the Bay Trail people always ask is this a part of the Bay Trail no the Bay Trail is actually to the west and uh, access is not allowed inside of the property per the easement. Um, I know people go in there and um, we've had some uh, challenges monitoring that. We did put up some signage showing people where they're allowed to go, where they're not allowed to go. And uh, here's a, a photo of, of one of those signs that's actually out there on the property. So here is a, another view of the property and you can see some of the easements and encumbrances on it. So ag again, the, uh, the parcel is uh, bounded in red here approximately. The Bay Trail is to the west, to the left on the slide. Uh, the public access easement comes from the south and it's on the southern top of the, of the berm and it goes on the eastern side and there's a little tailpiece that goes out and gives access to the bay. pg e is to the, to the uh, right or east of that. The district uh, retained a public or a uh, uh, easement for access to the property from SMART um, so that we could access the property to do maintenance work and other activities on there. Also to the very north in purple, that's the town of Corte Madera's um, drainage easement. So there's Shorebird March is a, a drainage facility. Uh, there's a pump station there. It's used to manage flood control for the town. <coughs> so back in March, we presented two alternatives of concepts that we were looking at. We have a four acre obligation but we were looking to restore the whole property so we would only have to come here once. Um, and uh, what, we were, what we were trying to do is do a large project and then try and get mitigation credits from regulatory agencies for that. So if we have future ferry projects, improvements at South Salido, improvements in San Francisco or improvements in, uh, in um, Larkspur, that we'd be able to use the credits from the mitigation that we establish here. Uh, so we presented this in March, and we showed two options. Alternative A, which maintained the existing public access easement, which is, um, uh, again, on the, on the right side of that slide, and it's bound in the, the red. So what would happen is we would need to breach on the northern side, uh, so the public access would continue, but you get out to the end, and then you'd have to turn around and come back. Uh, the other alternative was we would eliminate that altogether we would grade it down so that ecologically the, the area would restore um, really quite nicely. And we would create an upland area and relocate the public access onto this upland area. 
So following that presentation, we received public comments. There was a desire to maintain the existing public access, not to move it. And there was also a desire to maintain the informal loop trail. So even though there's not public access deeded all the way around the property, people use it and they, they uh, hike and walk and do other activities in this loop. They didn't want to go out and come back. We also met with regulatory agencies to discuss receiving credits for performing the additional marsh restoration. The agencies were uncomfortable with maintaining public access through the middle of a restored area. So we weren't very successful with uh, those negotiations, so we decided at this time, since we have a four-acre obligation, we're just going to do the four-acre property, uh, the four-acre uh, restoration. And so what we then did since that March presentation was we started looking at where could we do the four acres. So again, here's existing conditions on the left of the slide. And you can see that the informal trail, which is uh, on the northern and comes around the, uh, the wetland area that's already established on the upper uh, northwest corner. And what we're proposing is to uh, create a restoration directly adjacent to it. And what we would do is then move or relocate that informal trail so that people could continue walking all the way around the property. So then here's are going to be some photos showing where that's at. Uh, you could kind of kind of see here, and we took a photo uh, looking in that area. So again, in the upper part of the center of the screen, that's the pump station. You can see it actually pumping water from the uh, shorebird marsh into the channel. We would breach the channel on the northern uh, berm right there, and we would then do some nice grading inside of there to allow water to come in, the tidal to come in, and create some, some tidal marsh. It would be directly adjacent to an existing tidal marsh, which is functioning very well. On the other side of the channel, there's a tidal marsh, which is functioning well. And there's uh, clapper, California clapper rail uh, habitat uh, out there. So we are pretty confident that it would, um, it would create the habitat that the um, uh, biological the birds and the other creatures would like. So here's our, our design concept again. So you can see the town of Corte Madera drainage easement. That's the, the marsh. We would be directly adjacent to it, but we would not touch it. We would breach the northern drainage channel to allow the water to come in and create the tidal marsh. Um, we would create an upland fill, so we would not be off-hauling the material. We would just dispose of it on site and create uh, a larger upland area in the existing upland area. We would maintain the existing public access easement, and then we would also maintain a loop trail around it. Uh, you see there's also a seasonal wetland. We're disturbing some seasonal wetlands in our restoration project, so we're going to replace those with a uh, one-to-one -one replacement area. I know this is hard to see, so I apologize for that, but I just wanted to show you the, the gradual nature and the scale of the grading that's going to take place. Um, we believe that this would um, really biologically would create a, a very nice tidal wetland, leave refugia, leave room for future uh, sea level rise within the area for the, for the habitat that we're creating. I also want to say that we have met with the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We presented this to them, and they're um, uh, basically uh, happy with the project, the way that, that we're proposing it. So they've asked us to uh, submit our application. So we started submitting our application. And we're starting our CEQA process. We're going to be doing an initial study. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Again, we are not taking action on this tonight, but let's start with the council. Any council members have questions or? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, I've got uh, two questions. Is my mic on? Thank you. I've got two questions. Oh. Just, yeah. I'm going to try to. Yeah, that's talk louder. OK. Um, so I've got two questions. About, oh, there we go. Uh, two questions. One, uh, will this project come back to council for a comment uh, at some point in the future? We can certainly schedule that if you're interested in that, um, Council Member Beckman. I know that um, uh, you know the the Bridge District is here to talk to us about you know their pr current proposal. Um, they went to their committees, I believe, uh, back in June. But we're certainly happy to agendize that if that's something the council desires. Okay, great. And my second question, uh, I would appreciate if somebody could give us just a brief history of this site. I know it was originally wetland uh, and is obviously no longer wetland. Uh, I, I would turn that over to him. <laughs> uh, well, it was wetland many, many, many centuries ago, I agree. Right. And then it was filled in. Um, 
probably in the 1800s, I would say, if not, uh, if not sooner than that. But in the 18, 1800s, approximately, it was grazed land for cattle and whatnot. And it's always been a, a filled area. And, and when the, so it went through mainly grazed land and uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know if there was any industrial use that was out there, but it was, it was always a filled area since the late 1800s. Um, when the district constructed its ferry terminal in 1972, 73, it was used as a disposal site for the dredge material and it was meant to continue to be used as a dredge site, but the district opted to use other locations after that and since then it's just been a, uh, the condition it's been in now. Thank you. It's a way better answer than I would have <laughs> Questions? Here? What is the uh, mean elevation above uh, high tide of the property on average? It's about eight? Uh, it's, it's from, um, on the title pro in the entire parcel, um, some areas are Oh, I'm sorry. Can you come up to the mic? I'm sorry. We're we're on live TV. This shows elevations on it. So if you look at um, so the existing grade existing grades. Go ahead, John. So that says elevation nine. This is a nine. So it varies obviously across the across the the uh, property. The the berms themselves are, I want to say, around 10 to 12. And then when you get into the interior, it varies from that high elevation down to about uh, 8 to 7. In, on a king tide in midwinter, full moon, most of the area is wet, right? The interior of this does no, not get... doesn't. Not at this time. Okay. It, it, it varies. It doesn't get wet often. You know, our king tides around here, Councilmember Coomhart, as you may know, are in the seven, seven and a half range. That's when we have really big tides on, on this part of the bay. Um, so I would say not often does water breach in there, uh, but at high tide and during heavy rains, the parcel, um, you know, I would call it saturated or underwater at times. It, it uh, doesn't, if I could clarify, it, it doesn't breach, but it does fill up with, with rainwater, which is the seasonal wetlands, which are the fresh water. We also have fresh. seepage, so the water, the, it's not a perfect perimeter. So, um, you know, we get, we get penetration, uh, maybe not over the top of the berm, uh, but in any event, I think we're all saying the same thing, so. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, one question for Peter. Uh, is anything they're doing, uh, will it improve or limit our ability uh, when, when building future flood control? projects is there any way we can work together yeah that's a good question so Todd and and John and I um, all met I think it was a couple months ago now and we had a conversation about that um, and we let we let the the Golden Gate um, Bridge and Highway District know a couple of things one you know they're, they're pretty well aware that they showed some of our pump stations in action so they know our concerns about flood control here uh, we also um, you know we're, we're in the process of kicking off the climate adaptation grant, a big part of that is going to be assessing the marsh and marsh restoration and its value in terms of, uh, you know, a buffer between the town and the bay. Uh, and so, in, in our review, we are we're pretty confident that this project um, doesn't do anything to preclude any of our future efforts. Any surplus dirt they could put along the uh, levee, the uh, <coughs> smart trail? I don't know that that's been discussed. I think what, what John presented to you was um, there, and I think it's a good plan to the, the earth that they move on site, they're going to use to um, create a berm that serves as a boundary to the new tidal area that they're creating. Right. And that'll also serve as the, the elevated new walkway. Um, I'm sure they've done the calcs on the amount of cubic yards you're moving. I'm not sure that there's any excess. And we certainly haven't talked to Smart about bringing any earth onto their right of way. Is that a fair answer, John? That's a fair answer. OK. okay. Anybody else have heard? No? Uh, any member of the public have any questions? If you can, please come up to the microphone. And if there's more than one of you, you can kind of line up so we can kind of keep it moving. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Glenda Corning, Meadow Sweet Dairy. 
Um, I am thrilled with this plan. I am so happy that there's pedestrian access being maintained. Um, I long lobbied for a pedestrian bridge that I think if you were to install that when you wanted to do a larger project, I think you'd be able to flood the whole marsh and still provide access. I'm concerned that the public uh, right of way is getting really clogged with vegetation, foxtails, and all kinds of stuff. And I would love for part of this project to uh, include a plan for keeping that open. And um, I am also am very concerned about the way that the um, public interacts with the project. Um, I am horrified by the Marin, Marin Audubon project at the end of Industrial Way. It has industrial style, I mean, excuse me, uh, penal style fencing that <laughs> makes it so unfriendly. And, you know, I think that it's important that the public feel that they are a part of this project and take ownership and pride in it. And I helped fund that project and I'm embarrassed by it. So I hope that you'll create um, fencing that's friendlier and also take into advantage or uh, consideration what we see when we walk the trails because they have a huge berm that completely obscures the beauty of their project and I don't know exactly I haven't studied this plan but I just hope that you take all the people who walk that marsh I walk it every week m multiple times uh, into consideration when you're doing your planning and then uh, let's see sorry I'm all wobbly up here um, Anyway, I think, oh, and I'm concerned about Pampas and how that's going to be controlled. I think that our problem with homeless people in the, um, in the interior is largely because we have so much non-native vegetation. It's um, really easy to camp among the Pampas grasses. I love seeing the goats. And just want to say thank you for changing this project. I was horrified by the initial um, presentation, and I'm just really thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Tim Callis, 12 Meadow Ridge, Court of Madera. Um, I, I think it's a great plan and a, and a great compromise to the last plan. Um, can, can you put the aerial up of the, of the area? And part of this is for town council. I'm out there every day, um, so I know the area really well. Um, uh -oh. Ready? Yeah, just the whole, yeah, that's perfect. So. <clears throat> uh, this area, I think, was set up for flood control. That berm goes all the way around it. The only time that um, basically fills up with water is fresh water. On the southern border, there's, I think, three or four large French drains. So at high king tides, the king tides do go up uh, in the southern part uh, of this marsh. Um, in the winter, when there's heavy rains, this whole thing, I'd say 80% of it floods. It's a great uh, migratory bird area, and, and it's used heavily, you know, depending on the rains, November through, say, say April. So the, the only time when you breach um, that this is going to be effective is at super high king tides. I think it's all a great plan. Um, I think public access on that loop is great. Uh, the one thing I wanted to bring up that the town should be concerned about, and I'm sure with the bridge authority, there's two issues, liability, people with dogs, dog bites and then homeless people out there. Um, I'm going to step away from the mic for a minute here. Um, if, if you see almost all of this area is pompous grass plants, okay? And pompous grass is, um, it's uh, not indigenous, it's invasive. Uh, each one of those, and I, I'm no expert, I, I'm not an engineer, but you can Google it. Um, each one of those plants in its lifetime throws off a million seeds. I would guess there's a thousand, at least, just eyeballing it, a thousand pompous grass plants out there. So a thousand times a million, you do the math. On a prevailing wind, uh, which is almost always out of the south, those, those seeds are blowing out you know, into the county. So it's, it's a really massive um, invasion by those plants. That's where the homeless camps are, are because of, there's so much cover in it. If you're concerned about the habitat and restoring this area, <coughs> that should be a major objective of the project. The only way you get them out is taking the roots out. That's bulldozers, backhoes, et cetera. I know it's a big project, but if that's the concern, uh, and the town should be concerned about all these seeds that go into other areas of our community and other areas of the county, it, it, it's something to think about. 
Um, other than that, the public access, the area, it's beautiful. Uh, I think it's a great plant, but I, I really wanted to, uh, to bring up the pompous grass. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully that won't fall. <laughs> So my name is uh, Andrew Middleditch, and I also live over on Meadow Ridge in East uh, Corner Madera. And uh, and I, I, the changes in this project are definitely um, uh, an, an improvement from from my point of view. I definitely enjoy uh, walking on that loop in the marsh, and there's uh, abundant wildlife there, and it, it really is a, a, a pleasure of Corner Madera to have uh, access to that land. And there's also another interest I, which I have, which is as a as a kiteboarder, and uh, there is a very avid uh, wind sports and kiteboarding uh, community in the Bay Area and in Corte Madera. Um, and uh, there is the, the kiteboarding launch that we use is, is actually on uh, this berm. And uh, so I, I wanted to t tell you a little bit about that, make sure that people were aware of it, and then also uh, ask wh what the intention around that area is with the current plan because it wasn't entirely clear to me. But the, uh, essentially, the, the, the area that, uh, where the kiteboarders go to launch kites is right here at the, uh, the little tail end of the berm, which is uh, also um, one of the most beautiful parts of the trail, and it has access to the water and to the bay and to the views and so forth. So I, I just wanted to, my, my hope very much is that we maintain that access, but I also just wanted to ask. <laughs> the powers that be what the current plan entails for that aspect of the of the trail thanks okay thank you do you guys want to talk about that yeah i could respond um as i said the four acres is going to be on the north western side of the parcel we're not touching that part of it so that access that is there now will remain okay so i have some questions of john john <coughs> got some photos here <laughs> is the uh, are the acacia trees on the west Please use the mic. Are, are, <laughs> is the, um, are the acacia trees going to be remain? Are you not? Not determined at this time. Okay. I'd like to have those remain. That is a beautiful area for walking. It's like an enchanted forest, and that's what I tried. When I sent you the email, uh, you got a copy of a lot of the photos. And in the email that I sent, there is a link to photos year around. There's probably several thousand photos that you can take a look at of that marsh area. I've been walking that area, and, and by history, just a little history, I worked for the Golden Gate Bridge Highway and Transportation District for the ferry division when they set up at Larkspur. So I've worked there for about three and a half years, and I've walked that trail uh, many, many times since about 1975 when the levees were put in. So it looks like a really good plan, like it. Love the goats. I don't think you should, you should always keep the goats coming out every year. They've got great personalities. And if you folks haven't gone out to watch the goats, you got to. <laughs> They're like little kids. And each one of them does different things. And it's just a pleasure watching them. I hope this project goes through well. I love the idea that you're retaining the entire loop uh, because it would be a real bummer just to walk out and, and walk back in. Uh, we talk about you know, what happens with the dredging. Uh, it would be great uh, if the district, uh, the town, uh, the state of California could figure out a way to get all that dredging put in to put levees and build levees uh, for the town of Corte Madera. Uh, it would be a shame to start breaching all this area. And uh, for the, uh, the wind uh, surfer border, uh, that little uh, edge out there, I think is, how, how, fa how rapidly is that eroding? About five feet a year? It's not gonna be there very much longer. It's, it's almost disappeared. As a matter of fact, I used to walk all the way around out here. So when they first put in the, uh, uh, the spoils from the dredging, you could walk that entire area. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Any other? questions from the public okay thank you very much thank you for your presentation appreciate it um, we will now move on to the consent calendar the purpose of the consent calendar is to group items together which are routine have been discussed previously do not require further discussion they'll be approved by a single motion any member of the town council staff or public may request removal of an item uh, rescheduling will be at the discretion of the mayor and the town council is there a motion to 
Yeah. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, Does anybody want to remove anything from there, the consent calendar? Or? Uh, I don't want to remove anything, but I do want to explain why I should uh, abstain from voting on 4.1.3 uh, because uh, I am a member of the steering committee of the Christmas Tree Hill Neighborhood Response Group and uh, have helped plan the drill, and so I should not be voting on that, I believe, even though it's a volunteer nonprofit organization. Okay? Thank you. Just wanted to explain. Then I'm open up for a possible motion. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'd like. That we, um, uh, take down. Uh, items at 4.1. One through four, one point seven. Councilmember Bailey? Yes. Councilmember Beckman? Yes. Councilmember Coonhart? Yes, with the exception of <coughs> abstention on 4.1.3. Noted. Vice Mayor Andrews? Yes. Mayor Vazia? Yes. Okay, we have no public hearings. We're going to move to our first business item, 6.1, review and discussion of wireless communications facility regulations and a request for direction to staff. Again, we are not taking action on this item, but we are going to provide direction to staff. This is you, Adam, right? Correct, yeah, thank you. And, and yes, just to re reiterate, it's a discussion item this evening, and we're um, uh, hoping that the town council and council members will uh, receive some of the information we provided you with the staff report, try to answer some of your questions that you may have. Um, and receive public comment on this and then provide direction to staff regarding possible follow-up follow item. And as we've indicated in the staff report, there are several options that we've included uh, for your consideration. Um, you know, I think this item is, is here for a number of reasons. One, we've seen, we've received uh, both staff and I think all of you have received a number of emails and other forms of communication regarding um, wireless communication facilities that are um, have been around but are also I, th I think for a number of reasons and I'll get to that in a second have been um, uh, sort of more of a uh, issue and topic uh, for consideration in the recent months um, and uh, a number of communities surrounding communities in the Bay Area and elsewhere have sort of taken a recent look at their existing ordinances and sort of updated them or some have updated them or considered other actions with respect to uh, wireless communications facilities. And uh, so we wanted to come tonight and, and put this item on for discussion, hear from you and hear from the public and um, get some direction from the council on uh, where to go from here. Um, so I would just say a, a couple of things, big picture, uh, that I think are happening to um, bring this uh, to all of our, uh, you know, I, I guess more of a focus now, now more than in the recent past. There was, I think, when these first came out, there was quite a bit of a discussion around cell, uh, wireless facilities and cell towers and things like that. But as we know with technology, things, things change and often quite rapidly. So we are now, um, I think, in the midst of a generational shift in wireless technology, which is um, a little bit different. One is obviously we're continue to be more reliant uh, in all of our daily lives on wireless technology. Um, and a lot of new uh, thinking about where we go from here in the future is also going to rely more heavily on um, certain technologies. And so what we are seeing is in the next actually roll out, I think this year and this fall of new 5G technology um, that is um, requiring uh, new physical requirements, I guess, for these sorts of facilities. And specifically, this new technology in the future um, um, will require a greater number of locations for um, equipment, whether it's antennas and all the associated equipment that goes along with it. Um, so what you see wireless communications, uh, uh, telecommunications companies and their contractors doing are trying to densify their networks. Um, some of it is related to the 4G technology that we have today. We don't currently have 5G technology in Corte Madera or, or frankly the Bay Area. It's going to get rolled out I think in four different cities this fall. It's Sacramento, Houston, LA and one other. Um, but 
but we'll, I think we're going to see much more, uh, many more applications for physical locations of these antennas and related equipment. Um, they do um, promise faster service um, or so faster connections and data uploads and downloads, uh, but have shorter sort of radii in terms of their catchment areas and the ability to receive and send information. Um, so I think in anticipation of the greater number of applications, that's one part of it. At the same time, we're seeing a lot of regulatory uh, changes at the federal level um, and even certain bills that I think you've all seen at the state level and also at the congressional level or legislative le level at the United States, um, at the Capitol as well. So. Those are all sort of aimed, uh, the recent efforts that we've seen are aimed at removing certain barriers um, that um, would, would be barriers to the deployment of these wireless facilities, what they're calling small cell facilities, throughout the nation, frankly. And so it's, it's um, the, the FCC as the uh, rule uh, with the rulemaking authority that they have to implement some of the uh, legislative action of Congress has taken it upon themselves to come out with certain rules and orders that remove certain barriers that um, have been prevalent or at least they've been convinced have been prevalent over the last uh, several years as they like normal out. fees excuse me like normal fees for using our polls. <laughs> Correct. It, well, there's a there's a variety of things, and so I've outlined a number of things that have happened in the in in the staff report in the past, in the in the FCC, what they've sort of preempted the ability um, uh, from local authorities from prohibiting or having the effect of prohibiting deployment of telecommunication services or telecommunication facilities, um, and getting to actually what that means is what a lot of their rulemaking is about. And so things like um, uh, the town is not able to uh, regulate uh, the radio frequency or electromagnetic waves that comply with the FCC regulations. And so I think we've heard a lot of concern among people about actually the emissions and especially as we move to 5G about what the actual public health ramifications are of these um, um, this technology really is, um, uh, but really at the local level we're preempted from setting standards or different emission standards um, than what the uh, U.S. government and the FCC has, has ruled on. Uh, there's also prohibitions on sort of modifying existing wireless telecommunication facilities, so if you have an existing one, a wireless carrier can come in and, and modify that and make they basically have a volume of space within which they can uh, modify telecommunication facilities. Um, <coughs> um, and uh, there's also the installation of wireless, uh, preemptive installation of wireless telecommunication facilities and existing or new utility poles in the public right away. Um, in addition, there are certain time limits within which local authorities are required to act on applications for um, permits to actually locate these things in particular jurisdictions. Um, and I think that last point I made about um, preempting the installation of wireless telecommunication facilities on existing or new uh, utility uh, poles in the public right away also speaks to um, another change that's happened fairly recently, more recently in California, where um, the PUC, uh, Public Utilities Commission, has uh, determined and, uh, that uh, all the utility providers cannot basically have to allow for the installation or the co-location of wireless communication facilities, these smaller cell facilities on utility poles um, that, for example, PG&E owns and obviously that we have in Corte Madera. Um, so, uh, this, that sort of background and context, um, what we've done as staff is we've looked at sort of our current um, existing ordinance um, that was adopted in 2001 when these uh, sort of larger scale wireless communication facilities were, were being deployed in, in more like towers and, and whatnot. Um, 
And we've sort of done a little bit of analysis of in the discussion section of the staff report about um, potential considerations for the for the council. Um, just to real quickly, our, our ordinance does regulate um, the des design, placement, and construction of wireless communication facilities in town on private property. So in it speaks to certain zoning districts. So we have several, and the vast majority of our wireless communication facilities are <coughs> located, for example, on all the commercial properties along the highway. Um, and a lot of those, um, we've seen applications fairly recently for um, small cell 4G technology, but still small cell uh, wireless facilities on, for example, the roof of town center, um, at the office building, which is a high point. And so you see some of those. And if you pay close enough attention, you can see them up and down some of the office buildings along the highway. Um, however, our ordinance, the way it was crafted at that time, expressly exempt, exempted regulations for the deployment of wireless communications uh, facilities in the public right-of-way. Um, so we don't have an ordinance specifically um, that talks about regulations for the public right-of-way. The way we've been handling those in the past has been through encroachment permits that is uh, administered by the Public Works Department um, and reviewed by the Planning Department and Public Works Department as well. Um, we do not have a, um, I've not seen a large number of applications yet, um, although we have had a recent application um, for uh, wireless, uh, small cell wireless um, uh, facilities in the public right away. So we do have one that's actually pending and actually some of our thinking here has been uh, reflects upon our own sort of considerations in reviewing those applications. Um, and so uh, with that, I really, um, I wanted to uh, just, you know, we, we, we've, we've looked at this as much as we can. There's obviously a lot of moving pieces currently. It seems to be changing month to month um, with new rulings coming out from the FCC. There's state legislation that didn't pass um, last year, may come back in the future, and, and but all of them, I think, were in this environment of, I think there's a lot of national economic forces at play and even beyond that potentially that are moving toward a system where sort of the way that this is deemed as really important infrastructure throughout our country and regions and, and so on for economic development moving forward. Um, and so that's sort of the environment in which we, in with which uh, we are looking at our own local regulations. And we do see some you know, some significant limitations in the ability to really regulate. Um, uh, but there are, there are um, opportunities, I think, when you look at our current ordinance, especially when it comes to the public right away, to look at things like um, certain aesthetic requirements um, and uh, uh, other considerations that uh, we may want to look at moving forward. And so we did a review of <coughs> Some other uh, ordinances that have recently been passed, um, you know, I think we gravitated more toward a, the, the straightforward, somewhat simple approach that we saw with the city of Petaluma. If the council wants to see some action and, and follow up action on this, um, we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, that's, that's sort of the, the conclusion here. We do have four options um, at the end of the staff report um, that we are um, putting out to you for consideration. Um, Thanks, Adam. And I, I just wanted to add a couple, uh, couple pieces uh, on top of Adam's presentation. So, um, you're by, our vice mayor uh, Andrews is is a director of Marin Telecommunications Agency. The executive officer for MTA is Jean Bonander. She's a retired, longtime uh, city manager for Larkspur, um, and so she's been providing updates, as has our vice mayor, to us. Uh, on really the going on, as Adam said, there's a lot going on in the in the state level, federally with the FCC. Um, she gave a report to the Managers Association a few days ago, and one of the things as part of our discussion, we really focused on a few things. What can we talk about? What can't we? You know, uh, Mill Valley's what Mill Valley did. It was described in the paper as they did a moratorium. Well, you can't do a moratorium. That's not what they did. Uh, what Mill Valley and Petaluma did. That's 
again, staff is gravitating that way as a starting point uh, to this discussion um, of our point of focus. Um, something moving forward that we thought uh, at our county level would be important, and I just want to read it to you as, as our vice mayor is a member of the board of directors. We talked to Jean about what the direction is with the board of directors of how she should be spending her time, and we thought this was a really important issue to educate ourselves moving forward and make sure that the cities and towns are, are, are moving forward together uh, with this issue because there are two sides to this, this argument. But the mission of MTA, again, I just want to read it, is to, is to be a key policy-making and coordinating body related to telecommunication matters in Marin. This is in line with the core values that have defined MTA throughout its history in promoting availability, accessibility, affordability, and public inclusion in the advancement and enhancement of telecommunications infrastructure and services in Marin. So the manager's feeling at the county level is that we would like to see, and, and we've asked her to go back to the board of directors, to spend a good amount of her time um, on this issue to, to educate us moving forward and to not only report back to the board of directors but to the managers and our planning directors um, whether it be on a monthly basis or, or whatever moving forward a couple things Jean pointed out and she was supportive of that so that is coming your way mr okay. uh, vice mayor um, and she's like look there's a health impact conversation about that the, this there's also a homeland security impact related to this and um, we can't take action on health matters with this issue we, we can't as a council um, we take public comment on it but we can't take action we can't do a moratorium okay so what what do we have here and so it was interesting because this conversation was a after with Gene Bonander in our managers meeting was after Petaluma and Mill Valley took action and so we said, well, what do we, and I have a summary for you, and I know, I think we've all seen it as well in the staff report, but we're like, what did the FCC just do? So what the FCC did, just did is they basically put all that in conflict and headed us down the path of litigation. That's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a conversation of going, well, between now and January, what are our options? Well, it's Congress, and we don't have very many friends on this issue as it relates to this, you know, as to save us or, or to change any of the FCC's rulings. So that's gonna be a low probability. So in January, basically, some of these ordinances that are in place, they're in conflict with the FCC and law. So with Gene, we had a really, um, we had a really good um, conversation. We said, well, what's your recommendation? She's the most educated person in that room on this issue. She's really studied it from all sides. And I think the Vice Mayor can speak to that. So she said, listen, I, Based on everything, my recommendation to you uh, as, as city and town managers and the county administrator, when you go forward, she believes still at this point, a good starting point is to look at and have and direct staff to come back to council um, with something that Petaluma did. And, and, and it's to focus on the distance, um, aesthetics, um, and there's also some, if you read the FCC's rulings, they give a good argument of why they did it, but there's some conversations about fees still. You just have to be able to explain them. And so she thinks that's a good starting point, but we have to recognize as a council and a town that there's going to be multiple changes to this over the next two years. There's no exigency. Okay, so 5G technology and where we're at, there are some, there are some applications with 4G small cell technology coming our way. We want to protect our right-of-ways. We want to protect our, our poles. So there's no doubt about it. We need to do something. But, but this, this matter is not going to be solved for a couple of years. We're going to go through some litigation. You know, someone's going to go through litigation. Hopefully it's not the town of Corte Madera is the first. <laughs> we'll wait. But, but the point is we do need to probably do something. Uh, and, we, and staff's recommendation still, my recommendation as your town uh, manager is to consider, you know, some combination thereof of Mill Valley and Petaluma as a starting point, we don't have to, the distances can, I think staff, we're gonna spend some time now, I think they had a certain distance, we're gonna study that a little bit more, but I think those are the concepts that we would come back to you on, and really, honestly, I, those are the only areas that we really can. We can't do any more, um, and there's gonna be a lot of, convert, you know, I don't like passing ordinances that I think are gonna be in conflict with federal law, but I think it's just, it's a control thing. Uh, Jean, as she explained it, and I'll stop, uh, she said two things. Number one, your power poles or your, pole, your light poles are like gold for a town, and your right-of-ways are platinum. You gotta <laughs> protect them, and currently our telecommunications ordinances are outdated, and we need to do something with them. Um, but again, we're gonna have to take multiple shots as, of this as we go, and my recommendation again to the Vice Mayor, the Board of Directors, is that Jean Bonanders perfectly situated to really help us go through this two-year 
kind of you know roadmap as we move forward, reporting back to the planning directors and the and the manager. And we'll happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and just as a reminder, this is a discussion item. We are not taking action on this, but we are going to provide direction to staff. So let's start with questions from the council. Question. Um, Adam, I didn't see in the Petaluma ordinance any aesthetic criteria. I saw the specific things about so many feet from a residence and so forth, but I thought part of the problem was that we, I like the idea that in the same way any improvement to property has to be consistent with the character of the neighborhood. I'd like to have something like that in there. And if it's in the Petaluma ordinance, so I didn't see it. In the summary. It's yeah, I think they had about, uh, you know, these, I'm looking at page eight, I yeah. think of that attachment. Okay. Which is their, their ordinance from the August 6th meeting. Okay. Um, they have A through G. Yeah. And so one of the things, I mean, they don't, Letter B talks about <clears throat> sort of um, hiding the equipment or within the width of the existing utility pole. So that's that's sort of making it. As, I mean, that's it's not specifically saying the color or anything like that, but it's it's actually an aesthetic. Um, I, it's, a, it, it's an aesthetic consideration that they're doing there. Okay. And the undergrounding, I think, was another one I wanted to. If it's about. if it's not on a pole, it's got to be underground. Yeah, it's C I, as well. Okay, so that's the closest we get then. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, uh, there clearly are other, uh, we actually our existing wireless ordinance that uh, applies to private property does have requirements for sort of painting or, or camouflaging to the extent possible. And I think actually what you see is a lot of the, a lot of the carriers do this automatically when they apply anyways, because they realize that they're going to get caught up if they don't do that sort of thing. So, but, but yeah, I think clearly we could talk about the camouflaging or painting the color and the, the, the same, the brown or, or something to that effect. Um, but I think the bigger concerns were sort of the size and how much it sticks out. And so I think some of what Petalum was trying to do was contain it as much as possible to the width of the pole and the space that's um, tight, you know, tight around the pole or underground. So out of, out of sight as much as possible. Okay. Um, I give one other question, if you don't mind. I didn't, can you give me a scale? Because I didn't get a sense of it, although I can sort of deduce it if they have to be no closer than 1,500 from another one. How many are we anticipating yeah, when it's well, saturated there will be? Well, and I think, I think this is an interesting, I, uh, you know, I, I personally, when I look at this, I, I think there's going to be some problems with that number and oh. how it's actually implemented. Um, one of the major things that I think the FCC is trying to do is not have discrimination. So if, if one carrier puts, I think maybe you could have a distance requirement for each, potentially each carrier, but um, because therefore they're able to deploy them in a certain range or radius. But one carrier could be on one pole and another carrier could be on another pole and they have the different spacing for each, you know, each carrier. So, I, but that's a little bit off topic, but I think, um, I think it's a fair question. I don't think I know the answer to that, to be honest. It, okay. You know, but it's it's fairly. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I think what we probably will see is one. Even currently, there are areas, as we know, in Corte Madera, which is perceptions. You know, is, is spotty for the wireless stuff. So, yeah, downstairs. Um, but. Uh, but um, you have Wi-Fi on your phone. So I think what you'll see, considering I think a lot of it is coming from the highway, you're going to see probably more on the, um, you know, up, up around the, this area of town trying to get, you know, get coverage. And, and, and the size of one of these things is like a big suitcase yeah, so or something? Me, actually, I did, I did mean to bring, I have a couple of images that we can, what they're doing, so if you see on the, this image, just on the difference in the pole on the right, there's actually two poles, so it's a little bit tricky. Um, the one in front doesn't have the horizontal um, pieces at the top, so it's just like an extension of the existing utility pole. And then there's a sort of antenna on top of that. Actually, the next, maybe the next image, you can, if you, the next slide, there you go. Yeah. Oh. So there's, there's a couple of sort of examples. The one on the left is on more of like a PG&E utility pole where yeah. you'll see at the top of it an extension. And I think PG&E is requiring from their, their requirements and attachment requirements that there's this sort of a six foot, at least six foot separation from the top of the pole before you put 
an antenna up there. So it's actually, you're getting, you know, about an extra 10 feet of height on some of these poles in order to put the, okay. the small cell facilities on. Thank on you. There. And then there's the cab, the lower portion are these cabinets and other equipment. Um, that, that are the transmitters. Tran the transmitters, yeah, the antennas at the top. The antenna receives cell messages and then the transmitters put it out. And then it goes down, I believe, into the ground, into the fiber, I believe is how it works, but I'm not sure. No. It's, okay, thank it's you. a lot of, yeah. Jim, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I agree with moving towards the uh, Petaluma questions. Uh, thing. Uh, one question is, is, is there any way the towns in, Cordoba, in Marin could band together and say no until you get fiber out in the west side of the county? Because <laughs> they're already, uh, you know, their idea of high-speed internet there is uh, use net satellite service. And I would really like if there's any way we could make approval of this conditional on them, on the telcos providing decent internet service out on the west side of the county doing that. I think as a point of, like, a, a, as a group, and a broader spectrum of having a conversation, we could certainly evaluate that, but it's not something that we can dictate to them. We don't have, it's, it's, we can't do that, you know, but it's something that, it's not a, really a negotiation, it's more of a conversation and, <laughs> and, you know, there's some, there's some potential opportunities there that we could okay. certainly talk to them. And, and we are, we, the county administrator is part of our conversations mm -hmm. um, at the manager level. And so we are looking at, you know, if this is coming, are there some opportunities for us as a county um, yeah, uh, it's a, so absolutely. Let's not leave part of the county behind like we always do. Yeah. More questions? That's it. Questions? questions? Yeah, questions. Um, how many cell phone trans or cell transmitters do we have in town now? Do we know? I, I haven't done a count. Um, I can tell you, you in the last four years we've approved only about uh, three or four. I, I'd say approximately. Uh, 20 yeah okay and one of the things that I think I understand but this is a question uh, about the 5g is that it's functioning in a whole different uh, w wavelength and so you need a lot more of them what is the does it function if you have only a few or does it not require a an extensive network in order for it just to function? Or do we know I'm yet? Not, I'm not sure. I'm following. So does it? You said we do, that that we're going to be looking at densifying. Uh, well, and the yeah. question is, that's what how it, dense it does it need to be to function? And I, I acknowledge yeah, I that it does, we don't know yet because the implementation hasn't happened. But yeah, maybe. And frankly, maybe when they do roll these out in Sacramento, for example, uh, in LA, and that 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 sort of information will be, you know, they'll they'll have more information about that um, for. But, as well, they will it up. work for a a computer user here if the tower is more than 500 feet away? Will it function? Uh, you know, I've I, the only, I've seen I've read information that says um, it, it's it's you're able to use it from up to 2,000 feet, but that was more okay. than they thought. Yeah, um, so I, I imagine there's a lot of very that surprises you me. know variables that actually factor into the ultimate. And when we look at a rollout, it's not going to be sort of one body putting up one set of transmitters. It's going to be three, four, some number of competitive companies putting up all of theirs. So there's going to be almost uh, by its nature, a multiplication of multiplication, right? If it's going to function. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's likely the case. The question is how long before you know. It, it, there's generally what we see is one provider will come in to a certain area, um, and they're sort of uh, it's, they have the resources to do so. Um, it, so it's hard to say how exactly this will get yeah. implemented and, and by the different carriers. But I think there's ways to, you know, obviously encourage uh, that they utilize. Uh, if, if, for example, one carrier has already utilized one utility pole, then 
you try to make sure that they could, if, if, if the pole can withstand and is structurally capable of doing so, could use that same pole as well. I, I'm not sure but if that's But it's going to have to be a separate box. I mean, it's yes. ATT, Verizon, who, tell, yes. who they're going to all have to have separate boxes. Yeah, I would think. Jim, do you know, would you be able to say to what extent um, fiber optic takes care of the need that is uh, uh, ostensibly being, uh, you know, satisfied by a 5G system? Well. Fiber optic plus local Wi-Fi. If you read the press reports from the two big telcos, one of which is AT&T, the other is Verizon, okay, they seem to have adopted different business plans, okay? AT&T is pulling a lot of fiber. That will give people the high-speed internet. I, my impression is Verizon, they're trying to get the high-speed internet by putting in lots of uh, 5G uh, facilities. Uh, one thing I can uh, ask Jean is, Maybe if they're if she's aware of a consultant who can basically explain the basic technology yeah. to yeah. us, yeah. and maybe we can have a meeting here where you know since uh, the Marin Telecommunications Agency meets in these council chambers, have the person come in and sort of say, uh, MTA, this is the basic technology, and since in the middle of town we can invite everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Attend. In fact, you know, if, if there's enough interest, we could go down at the rec center. But you know. so, no questions. Eli, okay. go ahead. Yeah, I've, I've got kind of a bunch of questions. So if anybody wants to interrupt me, feel free to. Uh, Adam, thank you for the uh, very thorough staff report. Uh, you included a lot of information there. The concept of the public right of way seems to be pretty critical to this discussion, especially since we're effectively barred from regulating the installation of wireless telecommunication facilities on existing or new utility poles in the public right of way. I think it'd be helpful for me for sure and probably a lot of the public if you could just define uh, the extent of the public right of way. And, and does it include Hill Path, <laughs> which is a public right of way of a different kind? Councilmember Beckman, members um, of the council, I think the easiest way to think about it is um, our roads from curb to curb plus another 10 or 15 feet. Um, so most of the roads that are built in Corte Madera are built at a narrower width than the actual town right-of-way. So the right-of-way that Adam is, is referring to or that's referred to um, in the ordinance uh, basically is every single road or path that is public um, plus a buffer on, on either side. That's kind of the easiest way to think about it. Okay, would that mean that a lot of people's front yards are public right? Most town, most homeowners in Corte Madera, their, the front part of their front yard is in the town's right of way. Okay, thank you. Um, e Eli, can I just follow on yeah, pick another one? So in my front yard, there's a sidewalk and then there's like a strip. Parkway? Um, yeah, okay. Devil strip. Is that what it's called? It's <laughs> yes. like really hard to properly plant on that strip. But anyway, and the telephone pole is in that strip. That strip is a public right of way. Right? Even though I'm required to maintain it, it's a the the five G people can do whatever they like there, right? Due to the ordinances that your predecessors have adopted, you're okay. required to maintain it, yes. Um, okay. Sorry, sorry, Eli. No, no, no. I, please jump in if anybody has like piggyback questions. Um, what percent of the PG E poles or utility poles in town are in the public right of way? Would it be all of them? Yeah. Almost all of them. Yeah. I think okay. there may be one or two that aren't, but. Okay, Alrighty. Uh, and then I'm wondering, what is the current uh, status at the county level, like with the Board of Supervisors? What are their thoughts on uh, 5G rollout in Marin County? They're still grappling with it. Okay, grappling in, in what sense? Uh, in, we're kind of talking about it, but I don't think they've this is conclusion. so yeah and I, I want to say a lot of the regulations that are coming out at the the federal FCC rulings relate to sort of the relationship between the telecommunications providers and the utility owners um, whether that's you know PG&E or, or um, the people who provide the, the light poles or own the light poles and whatnot so um, and there's a lot of restrictions about how much they can actually 
they can't restrict it entirely. They have to allow it. But in terms of how, what conditions can those utility owners uh, place on those um, mm -hmm. attachments? And the key thing is the I think I, the chronology, as I recall, was like August 2nd, they passed the rule. August 3rd, they published it for 30-day comment period. And then the 31st day, they finalized it. So it's sort of like folks have had very little time to actually read the rules. It's, what, 120 pages long? Uh, There's a couple of them, yeah. There. And then they change out. them. Uh, uh, so it's like Thank you. Th 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 folks are just grappling with it right now. Uh, OK. I think it's actually. You know, we can summarize. It's actually some um, worthwhile reading some of these orders and, and, and whatnot because I think they at least outline from the perspective of the of their purview at least why this is why they're doing this, mm -hmm. um, which is important to understand. I think going into this, right? No, yeah, I really appreciate you uh, including some of the FCC uh, rules in the in the staff report. Uh, so my next couple of questions are, I was having sort of a, a tough time reconciling these really onerous, really restrictive FCC rules and state laws uh, with, what seems to, with what it seems like has been done or has been considered by uh, municipalities in Marin County. Uh, so the first question is, can we, and if so, to what extent regulate or prevent the, the placement of small cell facilities through zoning? Um, <laughs> I think it's broad. I think it's how you do it. I mean, there are. I think it's very clear that there are areas where local jurisdictions still can provide regulations and requirements. Um, the the key is that they can't have the material effect of prohibiting them, right. and that's where the argument comes into, you know, and that's where you have uh, several court cases have come out and just mm -hmm. trying to define where that line is and what does materially prohibit mm -hmm. the deployment of these. So um, I think it's everyone's trying, you know, I think there's probably a thousand variations on the same thing in terms of ordi ordinances that are out there and, and there's little tweaks here and there and everything's hanging on one word or the other word in, in, in how these are actually, um, what they're actually requiring and how they say things and, and then how they're implemented. So. Um, but I think the, the latest, you know, as these rules come out, it's becoming a little bit clearer what's too far, what's not. Um, and I think that's ultimately going to be up to some interpretations on our own legal mm -hmm. interpretations and judgment on some of that. And so that's certain things. If we do come back, we'll have to have those conversations, I think. And, um, Yes, yeah, so in the staff report it says, an ordinance that applies to facilities in the public right-of-way could more effectively regulate the operational and physical characteristics uh, of these 5G facilities. What latitude do we have to regulate the operational characteristics of these facilities? Um, I, think, I think one of the things that we've, um, a lot of ordinances do is that there's a couple of things that I think um, I would recommend, which would be essentially there's these go up and we know this is rapidly evolving technology and, and who knows 10 years from now they may not be needed anymore and may be on to something else. So there's things like putting in place requirements that they take them down when they're no longer working or utilized anymore. That's an operational thing that I think is clearly is permissible um, but and would be wise to do. So it's That's not just idea. clutter um, mm -hmm. and I think um, um, there's also uh, requirements for, could be for just reporting that they are in compliance with the F FCC requirements um, on an ongoing basis, not just the first time they come in for an application. Things like that, I would, I would just, as, as a starter, there may be others. Okay, we've got three more questions, so thank you everybody for your patience. Um, uh, elsewhere in the staff report, it says, additionally, federal regulations require local jurisdictions to act on applications for wireless facilities within a set amount of time. So these are the shot clocks. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, act on the applications. That means, at most, require minor changes, right, or, or require tweaking, because we can't deny an application. We can't prevent 
the deployment of these facilities, right? You, you can't, um, but there are circumstances in which if they don't meet the certain standards that have been set through the, the town's requirements that they can be mm -hmm. denied. So it's an action one way or the other um, on, on those particular applications. Um, is there any, I, I, I think that's, I, yeah, I mean, we haven't done that to this point, and, and I'm not sure um, under what circumstances we would do that, but clearly if there are certain standards and the application requirements, I think, are is basically an incomplete application or they don't have everything that they need to have to submit, then we could, we mm -hmm. could deny it. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, it's... I think clear to all of us based on the public comment that we've received, uh, staff obviously included, that the public's really concerned about the health implications, potential health implications of 5G. And I know that we are we're precluded from acting on the health implications. Are we precluded from requesting a report from a relevant body? I don't know if we can request a report from the civil grand jury or something, but is there, can we request a report on the potential health impacts? of a 5G rollout. Separate and apart from sort of the permitting process or any sort right, of ordinance right, right. or anything like just, um, well, yeah, I think, um, I don't know what, Can I'll let you answer that. This is a, just another interesting, so good question because we had the same one for Jane the other day when we had this conversation and, and she pointed out, you know, I as we relate to the health impacts, it's not apples to apples comparison. And there's a whole new like evaluation of this technology that needs to happen. And really it's way far, it's not there yet. And so mm -hmm. they're not, and again, this hasn't, the technology isn't completely, mm -hmm. we're not done yet. So we won't know for a little while. Um, mm -hmm. So something else that we've asked her to do is to really look at the, talk to the experts. There's a bunch of, uh, I don't know the, it's an acronym, the N-A-T-O-A. I don't know the, ac I don't know what that stands for. And so she's really, they're taking a leadership role and, and really um, giving updates. And so through them, we're asking when that, when that is available to us. I'm sorry, yeah, it's yes. the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors. Sorry, we have too many acronyms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not there yet. So okay. we could have certainly try to have someone come in, but it looks like it's not there yet. Right. I mean, so yeah, I would just, I think it's really important to the town that we stay on top of uh, you know, a as information comes out, whether it's about 5G, which I know information hasn't come out yet, or even if it's about 4G, the previous or the current uh, generation of wireless facilities, and I know that there's more, there's a lot more research about that since we've had 4G for a number of years now. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a much, it's a, it's a sort of a big national um, conversation of how you deal with science and and sort of. Maybe that is inconclusive um, in how you um, allow for things to move forward or not. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know part of it is based on this, um, I don't know. It, it, so it's, it's, a, it's a very large discussion, I think, that you're, you're talking about. And it applies to wireless or applies to other medical devices that come out or prescription medications or... Um, FDA approvals for certain, you know, uh, other things, and could sort of. Could the town we, require them to indemnify the town if there are any medical risks, and we get sued? I mean, we, that's a great there. idea. We can never get there. We, we could. We can. We can look at it. That's I mean, a great idea. Right? We aren't saying it's unsafe. No. We're just saying, just saying we don't know. This goes to hell. <laughs> You've got to pay us back. With the, with the way the legislation is going, I'll tell you that this, it's less than 1%. We're, not inhibiting, We're not inhibiting it at all. We're not inhibiting it at all. No. Are we? Okay, yeah, basically what, what, I, what I'm asking is that we make an effort to bring in as much information as possible to yeah. the town about, uh, about 5G as it, as it comes to light. And then my last two questions are about our ordinance that we're developing. Uh, so you included the Petaluma ordinance as sort of a, like something to template our, or like a starting place for our ordinance. Uh, and I liked their ordinance a lot. But then yeah. in reading the FCC's September 26 rules, I think Todd just touched on this earlier, but Petaluma's ordinance is in conflict with these new rules, right? Yeah, I, mean, I think that I think it could be considered that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's certain things in the new ruling that speak to some of the things about spacing requirements and mm -hmm. speak to the, 
aesthetic and undergrounding requirements. And, you know, again, whether they're too far or not in that direction, I, I think is ultimately a, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a legal question about how far they've gone. I would, I would say that probably 1,500 foot spacing requirements would run afoul of well, but of the of the recent rule and order. Um, I mean, what what I'm more concerned about is that I thought a 500 foot buffer around houses seemed like a good idea to me, but all you know, if streets are the public right of way, yep. telephone poles are on streets. All telephone poles are within well, m these telephone Correct. poles are within 500 feet of houses, and we can't regulate the deployment on these telephone Correct. poles. So doesn't that kind of the whole premise of that buffer is out the window, right? That's the way it looks. Okay, so yeah, my, my last thing was gonna be that I was wondering if we could, in our ordinance templated, or you know, sort of based uh, in principle off Petaluma's ordinance, if we could also have a buffer around schools, but perhaps that's a moot point. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, that okay. is all I have. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna open it up, unless there's other questions. From the we'll discuss later. Question. Uh, see, in town, the width of most of the older sidewalks is what, four feet? And then we've got another uh, two feet of, uh, what is it, park Things lawn, or the, I call it the devil strip, okay? Uh, if we cannot force them to underground their boxes, isn't that going to get us in trouble with ADA? That they're starting to Im impede transit uh, access across well, the, the side. The other boxes. equipment actually goes up on the pole above a certain height. So it's out of the way of presumably ADA. And, and we can require that yeah. it be up or under. Yes, and I think that's actually one thing that we can we would look at and talk about in terms of potential requirements. I know PG&E has also their own rules on that as well. They don't want you know, anything below a certain distance. So. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, we're going to open up for public comment now. Um, again, this is a discussion item. We are not taking action on this tonight. Um, we are going to provide direction to staff, hopefully, at the end. Um, if, you can, <laughs> if you can line up, if you don't mind. Uh, looks like we have a lot of people, I think, who want to speak about this. And uh, please make sure you give your name and address. That would be great. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. My name is Alex Statner. I live in Lucas Valley. Um, I've gone my entire life without being in these chambers, and so thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate all the work that you do. This mic's not working. The one day, can you not hear you me go, well? You got it. The one day that I come, we're talking about your gold and platinum. I love it. Um, it's typically something that you have a lot of control over, your own assets. And I believe in the larger scheme of things, there's been a big power grab by some very influential telecommunications companies. So I encourage you to do whatever you can now to protect those assets. And I believe that's what you've, you're considering. Um, I come to you, I'm an environmental scientist, and I have a small business, and we do industrial hygiene. Uh, we've done radio frequency surveys for single family homes, hospitals, schools, the civic center, you name it. We've done uh, a lot of professional consulting in the radio frequency environment. In that part of my life, early on, I thought that a lot of these health concerns that everybody talk about, I could you know, imagine the tinfoil hat. Um, I have come to a completely other understanding. I really believe that there are some people who are sensitive to radio frequency, radiation. And those people, you know, for the vast majority of us, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it. Um, but for those who are sensitive, it's a real curse. And I've met professionals, just like everyone here, who uh, was surprised by becoming sensitive to these things. Hundreds of people we've consulted with, they said, gosh, I thought everybody was crazy. But now it's me, and I feel so bad. And I can tell when I'm in close proximity to a cell tower or close proximity to a Wi-Fi station at their work. That's a real challenge for a working professional, obviously. But that's not recognized uh, by the American Medical Association um, or ADA. And so it, it, it's a challenge in this country. It is recognized in other countries. I just encourage you to consider those people. I believe that installing a new 5G antenna 
uh, outside of someone's home like that is tantamount to giving them an eviction notice or an additional tax of thousands of dollars to do remediation and hire someone like me to help them uh, keep that radiation out of their home. So I uh, encourage you to take a pause, perhaps use the precautionary principle in how you move forward, protect your assets the best you can, and I appreciate that you're all taking a deep look at this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Peter Hensel, Willow Avenue. Yeah, I certainly second uh, what that gentleman said. He's got the expertise, he's got the experience. Um, I was on the telecommunications committee in 2001, along with David uh, and Carla, Carla Condon was there and so forth. And, you know, we kind of hemmed and hawed about all this stuff. And there were maybe six of us, I, I forget. I, I it's, was never on it, it's, it's, a, it's a long time, you know. But um, around that time, uh, one of the telecommunications companies wanted to put a tower up on top of the spa. And wow, there was a big hue and cry. I mean, you would not believe how many people showed up at council. So people are kind of asleep. I mean, look, look at there's not many people here tonight, you know. But when it starts to get imminent, you know, when it's going to be next door to me, I mean, uh, people will wake up, believe me, you know. So I certainly second what that gentleman said about protect our assets and so on. And I'm just wondering why we can't you know, do a lot of this stuff with fiber optic cable. Um, I actually gave you something as an email that was, it's sort of a manifesto from a guy in Mill Valley that was a, uh, or, or has been a uh, software engineer. He has 39 years of experience in, in the industry, Frank Leahy. And he says we really don't need uh, to be doing this. Uh, Basically, what we're doing is we're kowtowing to uh, expedience, you know, from the big telecom carriers. You know, it's cheaper to put up these, uh, you know, um, um, small cell, you know, facilities rather than to underground. But in the long run, I mean, 5G uh, probably could be carried better um, on, on uh, fiber optic cable, this person is saying. So... Uh, I really think we need to kind of look at that. Maybe that's something we can regulate. We can't regulate 5G, but we can say, hey, you need to put it, uh, you know, underground or something. Um, and the other thing that occurred to me is about uh, the sensitivity. I mean, uh, yeah, there was a whole group of firefighters that, that uh, you know, basically uh, – uh, said, hey, we want these off our uh, rooftops. I mean, we're all getting uh, symptoms and so on. I mean, uh, I forget where that was, but I think it was in California. But, but, um, but and then they did remove them. They deferred to the firefighters because they were having sleeplessness and, and things like that, you know. But, but it, it just, mankind does not have a good track record on how we're handling the environment. You know, it's always profits over people, you know. And I've just seen in Corte Madera, you know, I've been here for 46 years now. I mean, where are the bees that used to be here? You know, I used to see bees all the time on my fruit trees. Now, uh, uh, man, that bee population is really tanked, you know. Very few butterflies anymore. How does this affect micro, micro, uh, migratory birds? So anyway, I'm probably going over three minutes, but... Uh, Peter, I'm going to ask you to wrap up. Yeah, okay. See if other people um, speak. But anyway, uh, yeah... Petaluma, that looks pretty good, but um, we need to make sure that we could, uh, you know, enforce it, that, that, you know, we have some teeth. And I just th think the whole thing is totally undemocratic, you know. That, you Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, Frank Leahy. Actually, uh, Peter introduced me uh, <laughs> unknowingly. Um, I work at, I'm a VP of engineering at a software company, has got the big tower in San Francisco. Um, so just to give you a sort of bona fides of, uh, I know my technology. I came to talk about a couple things. One is I've recently been in meetings with uh, Damon Connolly and uh, Dennis Rodini around 5G and fiber. If you're interested, I'd, you're talking about a consultant, I'd be happy to come and talk to you individually or in a group about fiber. There's actually an option to uh, do a public-private partnership uh, that would allow about $40 a month for everybody in Corte Madera to have fiber to the home 
Um, and that would include installation, fiber, the equipment, everything. We can talk about that separately. I think that's a really interesting uh, option for the city. You know, the city could uh, set the price. Uh, the city puts it on the on the tax on the ballot. I can I can leave some uh, background here if you if you'd like. The other thing I wanted to talk through was um, actually I came talk to talk about a couple things. One is the one of the questions was how many towers are there, uh, how many antennas are there. Um, I did a, uh, there's some online places you can find out. Within four miles of Tam High, there are 28 towers and there are 300 antennas. That just to give you a sense of scale. In Napa, there are permits out for more than 64 5G towers right now, just in downtown Napa. So, you know, you're talking about there's only 28 towers right now. Within four miles of Tam High, we're probably talking. 50 towers inside, 50 placements inside Corner Madera, if if they go with 5G, just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, Peter touched on this. Firefighters have a cutout. There is actually a cutout that does not allow cell towers to be placed on fire stations. Uh, I can uh, send you the the link to that, but you can look it up. The IAFF has a cutout, and they, uh, I think it was 2006, they want they don't want any cell placements on fire stations until. The, it's been proven that it's safe. Uh, it's actually in their, uh, in their documentation. Uh, the two other things I wanted to touch on were um, myth busters. Uh, 5G is not a fire safety, is not gonna help fire safety. In fact, it's gonna make it worse. Um, it's not needed for IoT, so Internet of Things. Uh, 5G is, is not needed for Internet of Things. You can do it with 3G and 4G, do it with Wi-Fi, you can do it with hardwired things today. There is nothing out there today that needs 5G to, uh, for Internet of Things. And the last thing, self-driving cars. There's a myth that, that 5G is gonna be useful for self-driving cars. It's not. You would never design a car that required 5G. All the self-driving software is in the car. And uh, even the car-to-car -car communication would never use the 5G towers. They'd have a mesh amongst themselves. Uh, it's just the latency is too, too long to, to use the towers and go back to the servers. Um, I'd like to leave, a, uh, leave this, uh, I made a copy here about the fire safety. Oh, good. Okay. Um, Thank you. Issues. Thank uh, you. Happy, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, happy to talk. And, Thank you. Uh, I'll reach out to you individually via email and give you my contact info about uh, Thank you. the fiber. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Rachel Gaunt. Um, just want to pick up on a few things you talked about um, just now. It's... Um, NAPA is 60 to 75 applications right now because of the they batched the permits, which means they were overwhelmed with them, and that's their way of running down the shot clocks. The shot clocks um, end about December, so they've got 60 to 75 um, installations going up right around downtown NAPA. And then uh, because everyone's allowed to jump on, that means that AT&T and T-Mobile and Sprint can also be co-located on those um, installations. Um, Rick, you talked about operation. There's nothing in the 1996 Telecommunications Act that says that local um, towns and cities can't operate the installation. They can't um, deny them, but you can actually operate them. And that will be very important because with this new millimeter length frequency, which is totally untested and, uh, and to date has only really been used, we think, in the military, um, we're talking about you know, a whole different ball game, and we want to be able to control or at least m regulate how much is being beamed at us. Um, a big study recently said that when they checked ordinary cell towers around the country, they found that about um, some of the towers were out by 600% over because they can update the, these installations just by software. So you know, we, we need to have some sort of measurement ongoing random. Um, <coughs> How much have I got left? Okay. I mean, mostly I think about, you know, what, what do you let into your home? And I, as a mother of children, and um, I don't want anyone to be able to kind of come in and um, in, in, invade the sort of the sanctity of your space. For example, we wouldn't let somebody beam a really bright light from the, from the street pole into your house 24-7 that you couldn't turn off. Nor would you let them beam um, very, very loud noise. No, what we're talking about is a, just a different part of the of the, the spectrum, um, and arguably, what we've since 
Canada just made um, wireless radiation, they upped it from a level two carcinogen to a level one carcinogen. Um, we should be you know, extremely worried about something so toxic being beamed into our homes with actually, with, with no right to say no thanks. Um, especially since we look at the actual, the, the corporate details. You know, the FCC is now headed by an ex-Verizon guy and there are other Verizon guys in it. So you have an industry that's essentially regulating itself. And I think it's very encouraging that there's a various groups, including the California League of Mayors, who are standing up and saying, this is an unjust law, the 1996 Act, and it's time for us to stand up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, Peter Chase on Montecito. Um, there's a lot to unpack here, and I would urge the Council to exercise caution and resistance, shall we say, to some of these issues that have been brought um, up. If I had cell service that was reliable at my house, I would feel great to say we don't need 5G, but I don't even have reliable cell service at my house. So that's a function of either more 4G towers or better 4G service in town, and how do you get there? I don't know, but Adam might say, let's put up one of the fir trees, fake fir tree antennas right here above City Hall. <laughs> Besides that, um, the last foot of fiber is the problem, right? So AT&T comes up our street, but they can't deliver what Xfinity can because there's one foot that they don't have any idea how to bridge the gap, literally one foot from their wire to my wire. They haven't figured that out. Nobody at AT&T can say, use this device to get the service that Comcast can give you. They can't do that. They don't know how. So the caution is, you know, let's get a service that we can rely on if we can push for that. If there's a way to encourage or create more possibility for reliable 4G service, that'd be great. Second part of this then is that in the greater realm of things, we'd love to underground telephone poles in this town. PG&E has stopped providing those programs available, usually, right? It takes a mountain to get that to happen anymore. So if we could get rid of poles, we'd be great. I was out of power for two days last winter, you know? So you wonder if these 5G cells are up there, they're drawing power from that pole, probably, so they're down. So, you know, again, if fiber's in the ground or some other way, if we have 4G service, let's not jump into a VHS or a Betamax system on top of these poles, right? Because <laughs> it's the candy flavor of the decade for the providers, right? So they really want to see something new that they got from the federal government with the new bandwidth. Let's not go there until we know more about it, and let's see if we can't get better service in town. Anecdotally and in the world of hearsay, one of our clients in the city where Fiber was not available until they dug up the street and brought it there because Comcast doesn't have anything downtown. And so you're either using DirecTV on a satellite dish or microwaves. So this entire building where we did a project had microwave towers on it. This woman's brother came in from NORAD and he said to her, get that microwave tower off of your roof because you're going to have a health problem. He said, the military knows it and I would not put that near my family. So that's what he told our client. And, you know, get it out of your life. So let's try to stay away from this. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else want to speak? Okay, we're going to close public comment and I'm going to bring it back to the council. And we need to provide direction to staff as to what to do next. Who would like to talk or start or? Propose something or anybody? Well, I, I, I have heard um, I guess uh, not. Alex and. Go ahead, David. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it's okay. Go ahead. Um, Alex suggested that we follow the precautionary principle. Peter is suggesting a, a corollary. Um, and um, Mr. Leahy is as well. And if there is a way for us to study this deeply for a long time as the industry is uh, actually developed standards. As I understand it, the 5G standards are not published yet. So the people don't know what they're making to. Uh, no telephone, no phones have it, right? And there, there aren't any that can have it yet. And um, I really like Jim's idea, which was just picked up again by Peter, of let's start saying, uh, let's have better um, 
fiber optic service, let's have better service. I know that on the two lower streets of Christmas Tree Hill, there is apparently fiber optic service, but it's not up where uh, the rest of us, most of us live. Uh, but there's some negotiation here with the providers that may be uh, in stock. And I love Jim's idea of um, inviting Gene um, in and, and having a deeper conversation. Go ahead, anyway. yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I I do uh, also agree that I I like the idea of exploring the potential promise of fiber optic. I'm not sure is that is that germane to what we're discussing though in this this ordinance because uh, this is about wireless, no. right? Not really? Yeah. 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 It's irrelevant, isn't it? So I mean, this is this is our wireless communications ordinance, right? Uh, so uh, and so basically, what I want to say about that is uh, I I like Petaluma's ordinance. I'm, I again, thank you for including that. I like the 500 foot buffer around houses because I, I think that really speaks to people's concerns about having this radiation coming into their homes. I would also think that a buffer around schools would make sense uh, and medical facilities. Although, do we have medical facilities in town? Really? I guess there's like a dent, there's like dental Dentist offices or psychiatrists. That, that so I, yeah, I would think that around sensitive facilities uh, like schools and medical facilities and then obviously homes, I think that is where you would want to buffer. Um, I'm concerned that, that once, you know, the full gamut of these FCC and state rules take effect that any, any good protective ordinance that we are able to adopt <laughs> as quickly as possible is going to be hmm. invalidated, is going to become illegal. Uh, so that, so in light of that concern, I would love to see us uh, work with the other municipalities uh, and the and the board of supervisors uh, to really lobby our our representatives at the state and federal level and say, look, this is absolutely unacceptable. That you know uh, the precautionary principle is mentioned multiple times, and I think it's I think it's kind of obscene that we are being prevented from even knowing whether or not something that we are forced to deploy deploy widely across our town is bad for us. Uh, I think they're they're effectively preventing us from fulfilling our number one duty uh, as, a, as government officials. Health uh, and safety. Right. Right. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Maybe the League of Cities. Yeah, the League of Cities. Exactly. Exactly. You're I'll, I'll go. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah. Um, <coughs> I actually agree with everything Eli just said. So nice work, Eli. Yeah, thank you. Um, Coming from you, that's a, that means a lot. I would, say, I would say, unlike probably any time you've ever heard me in the past, Todd and Adam and Teresa and Rebecca, I would be up for the fight with the federal government about if whether we have a right to control our own property. I mean, for goodness sake, this is unlike anything that I've ever seen before ever. Um, I'm not encouraging it, so if we can find a way to get around it, that's good, but I would not I would be in favor of challenging it as as much as we possibly can. Of course, the Petaluma Ordinance seems like a good way to start to come up with as restrictive a way as we can. Jim had a great idea about including an indemnity, <coughs> excuse me, provision in there. Anybody who wants to improve their property in town, um, we often make them sign something like that, don't we? <coughs> it seems like, <coughs> excuse me, we take all kinds of rational steps to protect our people in normal development. I don't know why we are being required to shed those basic protections here. I, by the way, I received, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 emails. Yes. They were all anti this. Did mm -hmm. anybody get any that were pro 5G? Not a one. Well, there, there are papers and there are positions and staff put uh, together one of those, which actually came from the um, prior national administration's FCC director about the promise and the potential and the international competitiveness and so forth and that that theme is carried forward to the present uh, leaders in DC so it's not it's not a one party um, position but one thing this particular FCC is uh, much more aggressive than its predecessors uh, next up you know if you enjoy watching this at home, the peg fees are under threat. They're, uh, once they do away with the fees for cell towers, they're going to do away with peg fees for uh, the cable companies. So it's sort of like one thing after another. So, 
Right, and I mean, just kind of following up on what you said, David, I mean, I understand the benefits of 5G. I understand that it has huge economic and even national security implications. But at the same time, we, we do have to know whether or not this is carcinogenic. I think that that's critical. Uh, so. so, okay, I mean, part of me is cautious the other way as well. Just because everybody feels so strongly a certain way doesn't mean that there's there isn't some explanation and that we're, the reason why we're getting worked up about it is in the absence of an explanation, but I wouldn't mind a little more deliberation before these clocks start ticking, which is the predicament we're currently in, right? Somebody makes an application, we have to act within 60 days or something like that, right? Yeah, correct. No, it, there's very, there's differing shot clocks for different types of applications, um, but they range from 60 to 150 days. So, so my, my, my suggestion in the direction is simply that we ask staff to come up with, to, to examine, and maybe in conjunction with Teresa, the most restrictive series of criteria that we can come up with that we think pass muster and go with that, right? I, I, don't, I don't know why we're not allowed to find, as a council, that we've done a diligent analysis of this thing and that out of concern for the health and safety of our people, we don't want to do it. I don't know why we're not allowed to do that. It doesn't seem, it seems like we should be allowed to do that for our town, but in any event, um, or that it conflicts with longstanding general plan uh, criteria related to privacy or uh, property development or aesthetic standards or um, development of our, you know, improvements on our property or whatever else. Um, so in any event, um, uh, my direction would simply be to, to, I'm okay with the Petaluma thing. I think we can beef it up even more. Ta By the way, you had some excellent suggestions, Adam, which I can't recall now, but remember you had a couple things about other ways that we could begin to think about modifying the circumstances under which, for example, make them take it down afterward. And was there one other thing you said, which I can't remember? The, mo the monitoring. Yeah, the monitoring. By Those all phone make phone. sense to me. I would agree to pursue the Petaluma direction as well mm -hmm. and, and see what happens. Does anybody? <laughs> I mean, that's about all we can do. Um, yeah. Good well, luck. Yeah. One Good thing luck I would us. like folks to consider is if we're going to fight, do we want to make one of the criteria for, for fighting that the FCC implements their previously promised uh, uh, program to uh, provide high-speed internet in the rural areas, because that goes back to at least when Al Gore was vice president. <laughs> and they, but, but that's beyond our jurisdiction. we got to yeah. limit to what's within the, the county property, or the town well, property. Yeah, but I, I guess what I'm saying is if the other towns and the county can get together and agree on sort of a united position, that, hey, you know, I, take I, care I, of your previous commitment before you bring on a new one. But that's only if we're <laughs> determined to fight. Get, get wireless we working on Montecito before you uh, put a new system in. Excuse me? Uh, let's, let's have all areas of town functional with existing uh, right. wireless technology. Wish we're not. Do you guys have direction? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I think. I mean, yeah, it's not perfect, but I think, no, I th it's, I think it's clear it's enough to. I think it's consistent with sort of the direction we were writing in our staff okay. report, the staff report as well. We've got direction, and we can come back and have another meeting eventually. Yeah, yeah. Try to get sounds, somewhere. Sounds like it. Okay. Can I just add one more thing? Sorry. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, I think option four in the staff report uh, included continue monitoring legislative developments. I'm sure you guys would do that anyways, but please, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, uh, we provided direction. We're going to move on to sanitary district business items. Approval of response to grand jury report item six point two point one. Nothing clears the room like the sanitary district. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here! Come on, everybody. We're going to talk about sanitary district number two. We're talking about sanitation. <laughs> <laughs> They're stealing our shit. Okay, Peter. Uh, thank you, District Board President Ravazio. I'm going to lick my wounds here as the room <laughs> emptied. 
<laughs> and my business is not cared for <laughs> the way future unknown we care things here. that may or may not happen. We all care. We uh, care. <clears throat> so before you, uh, this item is our required response per the penal code uh, to the grand jury. Uh, this is a, a item that we have looked at when uh, it came out in April of this year. We didn't quite have time to get to it, and, and in all honesty, we asked for an extension, and we were granted one. So um, and one thing to be aware of is that this response is due by October 13th, so I'd ask that any action you take tonight uh, take that into consideration and that we get anything done by that October 13th deadline. I tried to provide a, a brief summary uh, in the background section of the staff report. Uh, a lot of this language just came from the uh, grand jury report itself. Uh, but I do think it highlights uh, something that we all are pretty aware of, and that is that uh, Marin has grown and changed over time. Uh, I would say pretty much uh, from the mid-1800s uh, until the development of the Golden Gate Bridge, and then in a different way after the Golden Gate Bridge was constructed. Um, I think it was. Maybe so many of you people know 36, 37, somewhere 37. around there. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I guessed it correctly. So that really changed uh, uh, Marin's makeup in terms of <coughs> governance, districts, services. And I think for me, one of the things that the grand jury report gets at is the fact that we probably have not a great structure uh, in 2018 uh, that, that has changed since, since 1937. And so from that standpoint, I do believe that there is some merit in terms of the overall push. Uh, for consolidation of special districts. And I think I can see to that point uh, later in the staff report on page two. Uh, <laughs> one thing that I think that is important for you all to know is that the Joint Powers Authority that basically uh, we're a part of, so Senator Fell, uh, Ross Valley, uh, Corte Madera, Senator District 2, uh, we all basically give authority to um, the Central Marin Sanitation Agency to operate and clean and treat. Uh, the treatment facility, and we deliver uh, sewage to them, all three of these districts. That relationship, as far as I've come to understand it, I meet with the managers once a month. Uh, we have a regular agenda. We all coordinate. We all talk about issues that are district-wide. Um, so I didn't get the feeling in reading the grand jury report that they had a good understanding of the functionality of the JPA as it is now. Um, I think it's a strong uh, system, and it's working pretty well. Uh, I also, uh, in all honesty, took a little bit of issue with their recommendation that at the very next Sanitary District Board meeting, we take action to begin consolidation. Uh, I don't think that's possible, and I don't recommend we do that. The attachments one and two are basically uh, a template that, that other districts are using, and I filled out on behalf uh, of uh, Chair Ravazio, who may or may not want to change any of those and is welcome to. Uh, same is true for uh, the actual response. Uh, which we hope to submit uh, on time. And the last thing I would ask uh, that you look at, if you haven't already, is just the categories of uh, the consolidation action list, which basically look at all of our assets, things that the board should take on, things that are of financial nature, uh, what would happen with LAFCO, which would govern any kind of changes in terms of um, how jurisdictions come together, uh, the legal implications, and then um, operations, the union and labor ones, as well as an implementation process. So this uh, attachment to me really highlights, if someone asks, well, what's the, what's the problem? You know, why, why, why aren't we consolidating immediately? I would give them uh, attachment two, which was developed 10 years ago uh, and, and hasn't quite been acted on yet. So um, <clears throat> those are the, the explanations I have. I don't know uh, if, Todd, if you want to add anything else, but we're certainly here to, to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, I would just also uh, can't emphasize enough. I thought Peter did a, uh, was very thoughtful in what he just said and in his report. Um, I would just say the town of Corte Madera, it's proven track record on consolidation when it makes sense. I, we don't, we're, we're the standard. We don't have to say anything. Our actions speak for itself. And it's something we'll continue to evaluate as staff. I mean, as attachment two, we're going to look at this for the next five years. But what I want to really emphasize, and they didn't touch on it, you know, we have 25 plus million dollars in capital improvement projects that we're going to be doing for the next five years. And so there's a lot going on. And, and some of the, the economies to scale and efficiency and savings with staff, CalPERS, unfunded liabilities, right? When you consolidate, you can, you can, share some of those um, liabilities and save money and efficiencies. We've done that with police and fire. It's not the case with the sanitary district, right? We already get to, we don't have employees within the sanitary district. We share staff, 
you know, amongst ourselves. And so there's a huge savings. It's one of the reasons why our fees are half of what our, our, our you know, cohorts are in the county. So, um, so it's a different type of analysis. It's a little different for me as a town manager and, and Peter as a district manager as we've compared some of the other consolidations on the public safety side. It's complicated, as Peter said. And so it's something we're going to continue to evaluate because there are some merits, there's some opportunity. But really, I would just tell you, I don't think you'll have a recommendation of even talking about consolidation for at least the next five years. When we improve our infrastructure, when we completely can, can share with our cohorts the state of our infrastructure and they can do the same, and understand it to make sure it's apples to apples. Um, I just I don't see us um, really coming back to you until you know and for for at least five years. There's a lot to this, but it's something that we'll continue uh, to really work on and evaluate. And lastly, um, I know we've talked about it on the last couple of grand jury reports. It really seems like this last grand jury and the grand jury before has put out a lot of reports. And I don't think that the number of reports are helpful. I think it's it's it's. It, it's maybe some narrow, th good topics, but it, it's less than helpful to set your next meeting and consolidate. I mean, I, I just really, I, that's, that's what we have. And, and so I, I've reached out um, and, and to Judge Hawkinson um, and to ask, you know, as a town manager, I haven't been interviewed in the last two years. Um, and so I've asked to put me on the orientation when new uh, grand juries are put in place. I used to be one of the, pre I would go and, we would just, as, as public officials, talk to the grand jury and try to give them perspective. And I really want to try to give them perspective of the upcoming grand jury of like, look, it's not the number of reports that you put out, it's the quality of it. And to really focus on a couple areas and what is helpful for us as councils and staff um, uh, uh, when you do give a report. You know, there's some information that could be really helpful for us because they are taking on really important topics, but I feel like they're, they, the, the quality of the report or the time spent, they just, it's, it's difficult for them to give us that analysis. And so I'm, I'm gonna share some perspective, hopefully, uh, with the upcoming uh, grand jury. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Any questions from the council? Jim? I have a question. Um, if we already have a joint powers authority, which includes the three agencies, or the three entities, I should say, and if we'd have no employees, what would consolidation mean? Uh, what would be different I I than what we have right now? Uh, the you short answer to that uh, uh, is that my life would get a lot easier because we would have uh, no responsibility for the infrastructure. So the new entity, not the town of, so right now you all act as Town of Bedore Coordinator Council and Sanitary District Board. So there wouldn't be a Sanitary District Board, there would be a new entity board. Uh, and then of course the maintenance and the responsibility and the assets and the investments and the infrastructure would happen at that agency, not at the town of Corte Madera. Okay. So from an actual daily operation standpoint, it would be wonderful uh, to to um, have this consolidation take place, uh, but I think as Todd mentioned, we're we're a number of years away from evaluating a lot of different things before uh, we could get to that point. Um, so that's the best way I could summarize what would be different. Things would be dramatically different for us as staff and you as a board. And is is anybody of us on the Joint Powers Authority? Board per se. Eli is going to be moving in. Diane first is finishing up right now. Right on the not not Senator District Two, but CM the sewage but plan. We we are all the the SD two board. We're SD two. Okay, Central Marin Sanitation Agency JPA. Okay, cool. D Director Brown, in your assessment, was the grand jury aware of the work that was done more than a decade ago to look at uh, consolidation? I, I don't know that they were. Um, the, the information is publicly available, um, and if they were, they didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Actually, this came up, and I, I'd like to double check with you and email you all back, because I'd like to know for sure whether or not they were made aware. Um, but I'll check with my colleagues and let you know. Thank you. Any questions from the council? No, I'm ready to make snide comments, so. We'll open up for public comment. Can you come to the microphone, please? Roy Wolford, 37 C. Wolf Passage. First of all, I want to thank the person who put this agenda together because I had four items I wanted to talk about tonight, and that's far more than I've had in probably the last five years, <laughs> or maybe even ten. Uh, I'm heartened to hear that the uh, town is uh, not anxious to move forward 
uh, with a consolidation program. It's got to be a really good deal for the town in order to do that. Uh, because we're a smaller community, I, I think we would wind up having to pay more, uh, as taxpayers would have to pay more uh, than perhaps the larger communities. It'll make a bigger impact on us than, uh, you know, as being a smaller community. So um, I'm glad. And, and Peter, uh, I hung around because I thought it was important just let you know because you made that comment that no one is hanging around i hung around for you baby <laughs> so, so so anyway uh yeah it, it, pushing it off because uh, I, I think uh, uh i did have uh a, a meeting uh, with my my wife and i had a meeting with todd and he explained to us a lot of things that were going on with the sanitary district and there's i think there's a fair amount of funding that we have available to to do different projects and uh uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to help out and, and contribute and, and give some ideas on the best way to spend that money. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I will bring it back to the council for comments. Sloan, did you want to? No, I'm, good job, Peter, as usual. I'm, unless you guys want to have a discussion, I'll just move. I'll make the motion, but you well, tell me. Second. I want to make some snide <laughs> comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Jim, Jim has something to say. Go ahead. I, uh, first, when folks look at the consolidation, they could look at Senatory District Number Two finances. They can also look at the fact that it doesn't have any pensions or post-retirement benefit obligations. And so, if we marry our Sanitary District with anybody, we're going to be picking up their pension liabilities. Uh, and also, my impression is the. Uh, organizations we'd be merging with have had dysfunctional problems over the years. <laughs> okay, is that, is that a polite way to put it? That's a fair point. Yeah. yeah, and do we really want to take our district that actually works and turn it over to something that does. organizations where they're trying to reform themselves? And lastly, Peter, you're a hell of a lot more polite than I, <laughs> I could ever be. If I had to write this memo, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough. Okay, uh, if I would just echo what Jim just said, I'm a huge fan of consolidation in general. I worked on Central Marin Police when we brought in San Anselmo, and the standard there was provide better service and save money, and we did that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not seeing any evidence that that would do that here. I mean, we did the same thing. I've worked on Central Marin Fire for the past few years, mm -hmm. same thing. And as Jim pointed out, some of our cohorts in these other groups have had some issues yes <laughs> and uh, we've actually run fairly well and I don't see any benefit to us mm -hmm. moving forward with something like this with consolidation right now it makes sense yeah. for us to stay kind of just where we are and keep doing what we're doing so I would I agree with you on all those points this. yeah um, I would say I was disappointed by the report uh, and I really appreciate Todd that you reached out to Judge Hawkinson about the uh, sort of quality issue with the civil grand jury reports. Uh, and I, honestly, I feel bad for you guys that you had to take the time to, you know, you're, you're really busy. You have a lot of important work to do. I, I felt bad that you had to take the time to read and respond to this report uh, that, to me, seemed like there was evidence that it was lacking, you know, even due diligence. So that's my two cents. Okay. Then I guess I can entertain a motion to approve the I, response. I, I, I think you already made the response or oh. did you did you i move that we that we uh, approve the attached response for the mayor to send is there a second second board member bailey yes board member beckman yes board member kunhart yes vice president andrews yes president ravazio yes okay moving on town manager and council reports god <laughs> Just really quickly, at the top of our list, the staff is to formalize at least one, possibly two uh, community workshops about the lateral um, policy. Um, and so uh, Rory has been, I've, I've been spending some time with Rory and he shared some information with the council as well. Um, it's something staff is actually going to, before one of the workshops, we're gonna sit down with Rory one more time to get some perspective. Um, I think he has really good perspective in, in some of these areas, and I'm sure he'll be part of those conversations in the uh, in our community workshops. But that is a priority. We're just we're still trying to finalize some information among staff before we schedule that workshop. So that's at the top of our list, and probably in the next 30 days, you'll see something. Can I ask a question about the lateral? Yes. 
Uh, in one of the documents, they mentioned the original formation of the sewer district would define who's responsible for what. Do we have a copy of it? And you, have you been able to research that, or is it one of the to-do things? We'll yeah. look. We'll get it. Yeah. Thanks. That's all. Town Council, David, any reports? Yes, I have uh, two. Um, I attended the uh, quarterly report of the Safe Routes to School, Larksburg and Court of Madeira. Um, you may be interested to know that there are now 30, 39 schools in the Safe Routes to School program within the county. There is a new small project solicitation, a project's under $25,000. So there's a new um, potential, and um, if we happen to have any small single intersection, a <laughs> single ramp projects for under $25,000. We might uh, think about tossing it into that mix. Um, the uh, most interesting thing of that was the whole Redwood High School, given their growth, uh, they now have 475 seniors that go into 550 seniors and only 350 on-campus parking spaces. They're changing the, all the rules with respect to parking. It affects the neighborhoods all around. One of the most interesting things, and two of the most interesting things in my mind are one, they're giving a new priority for carpools and a, a larger number of carpool sites. <laughs> Seems to me to be entirely appropriate. And um, no, they're not gonna issue any permits to park to those who live within a 20 minute walk to Redwood High, hmm. which I think makes eminent sense. Of course, there are complaints from Re Larkspur residents already. I also learned that the Marin Transit buses, if anybody has questioned whether or not transit is well used, the Marin Transit buses delivering students to school are full to capacity. And uh, Marin Transit, I determined at the next meeting I'm gonna report on, is in the process of ordering two new buses um, for what that's worth. The second um, report, is, any questions on safe routes to school at all? Um, the uh, Transportation Authority of Marin, a um, couple of interesting things. The uh, MTC it, uh, region wide is, adv is uh, advancing with a new very expensive clipper card service system, which will cover all transit services of all kinds in the whole region, supposedly. It's an expensive process to implement. Route 37, uh, the Transportation Authority of Marin has made a formal application for a bunch of money, $15 million from the Regional um, Transportation Commission for um, funding the first bit of analysis of raising the western portion of 37 and, in, and installing new levees such that it won't flood the way it did at the beginning of last year in the heavy rains and, and king tides of the beginning of last year. This is a long-term project and it's um, now moving forward with plants and of course the entire corridor of 37 is going to be an analyzed but a variety of other parties um, are involved with that the um, it was also I, I attended and and the um, director brown attended the diesel free by 33 uh, meeting campaign and it's part of the collateral events of the global climate summit which i found to be very uh, exciting and um, uh, Supervisor Rice is asking Corte Madera if we would join her and others in signing on to the Diesel Free by 33 campaign. And uh, I individually have signed on to the Diesel Free by 33 campaign. I think from my point of view, it's not just about health. Diesel fuel, it burns more dirty than any other. Uh, so it is pr about protecting health, but it's also about um, enhancing innovation and just putting out the goal and saying 15 years from now we are going to be diesel free says let's look at bus acquisition, let's look at how we run our garbage trucks, let's look at everything that we do with diesel and work towards eliminating it. And I'd love to see us at a future meeting when it's properly agendized come to a uh, council position on diesel free by 33. And uh, you, you may report, you may want to report an MCI. Oh, I did ahead. attend it as an alternate. No, as an alternate, I, I attended and back uh, and uh, went to the MCE uh, board. 
Yeah, retreat. you know, David, actually your reporting is excellent. So if you want to go on about marine clean energy, I'm good <laughs> no, with it. No, I, I, I think you, you ought to. I think you are. Okay, I'm going to call it. My Eli, you're up next. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the California League of Cities is strongly opposed, opposed to Proposition 6, uh, as is MTC. They're both concerned about the, the sharp drop uh, in state funds for transportation, uh, concerned about the effects that this is going to have on the quality of our roadways, on congestion, uh, and also on the safety of drivers. Uh, and then I attended this uh, earlier today, the Chamber of Commerce's uh, monthly board meeting. Uh, a number of uh, kind of town town events, uh, town uh, issues came up. So uh, there's a lot of concern from especially the, the malls about uh, the sewer ordinance. I know that uh, the town manager is currently in discussions uh, with the business community about trying to find uh, the most mutually agreeable possible path forward on that. I know that uh, this ordinance was passed by the last council uh, and it, it had to be passed. Uh, I, I understand that we were going to face uh, massive fines, right, if, it, if we didn't uh, take action here. So, so uh, I understand that that is moving forward. Uh, I, I don't know the negotiation is the right word. Discussion. That discussion is happening. Um, but I, I got an earful about that uh, today. Um, what else did we have here? Uh, they, the uh, Chamber of Commerce's board just asked that they be kept uh, more abreast of sort of uh, town ordinances as they develop. Uh, there seemed to be sort of a misconception at the meeting. Uh, they seemed to think that council is aware of the, the form that ordinances are going to take months before they are introduced at council. Uh, so I kind of had to say that that's, that's actually not the case. These, these ordinances take months of, of development by staff before they're introduced to the council. And then uh, the sort of time for uh, for the, uh, the the sort of time for the uh, chamber to work through their council liaison to uh, try and mold these ordinances is in the, the two-week period in between when the ordinance is introduced and voted on. Uh, so I, I kind of tried to uh, clear that up a little bit, and I think that uh, resolves some confusion. Uh, there's some chamber events coming up this month, uh, notably Oktoberfest in Mankey Park on October 13th. Uh, and the chamber is holding a joint mixer at 21 Tamil Vista, uh, co-hosted with two local businesses uh, on October 17th. Uh, Councilmember Beckman, may I add something? Yeah, please. To that report? Okay. So as a practice, uh, your town manager meets with um, multiple board members for the chamber on a monthly basis. And actually, if you pick up the phone and text or call me at any point, we're going to have a discussion. And so the lines of communication, I will argue, are probably pretty solid if you want to compare it to any other city or town in the history. What I'll also tell you is that, yes, when we unrolled this, the, the sanitary district guidelines, um, there was some confusion, right? It's complicated. I think we struggle with it. But what I'll tell you is I sat down with the town center and the village shopping center. And so met with their leadership and really the expectation at this point, and there should be no confusion. Um, and they started off of, look, we all want the same thing. We don't want raw sewage going into the into the bay and so but we asked your director asked them to test their system let's see the state of the system and based on that test which is about ten to twelve thousand dollars for each of them for the entire center to put in perspective and so we asked them to put that into their fiscal budget coming up because they go off annual budgets mm -hmm. test your lines and then we'll come back and we'll, our staff your staff will meet and we'll prioritize the state of your systems priority one being it's a disaster and emergency, we need to replace it. And then let's have a 10, 15, 20 year plan. Because when we report out to the federal agencies, we need to show we're making progress. Mm -hmm. So just so you know, that is the expectation of your staff. Um, you know, ordinances are sometimes guidelines and, and it's not, um, it's, sometimes it has to be cookie cutter. There's, there's, there's nuances to the shopping centers, to residential, to homeowners associations. And we, we understand that. So I just want you to know that your town manager and staff uh, met with them there should be no surprises and honestly in any forum I, I i don't think that people would be upset with the town of how we've approached our shopping centers we're Great. good partners and i want you to know a very thoughtful uh, conversation was had i'm really surprised to hear that i actually have a meeting tomorrow with the chamber right and, and i will have that conversation with and i, I would also like to mention though that that multiple yeah. people said that they're really appreciative of these i understand that the monthly meetings between them and you is a new is a relatively new uh tradition Last year. right so they they 
many people, I mean, multiple people had really good things to say about that. They say that they think it's been really helpful. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. I just wanted to be clear, I, and I'm not being, uh, maybe I'm being a little overly we'll sensitive tonight, we'll but I just, you. it's really important. And, and one other thing is, as it related to the ordinance, it was really like guy. an expectation. Like, right, it, we could have had a lot of, Pick on the new guy. a lot of um, conversations with the shopping center leading up, but as I told some of them, it, that was going to be in place because that's an expectation that we have to. Okay. Moving forward, so I'm sorry. I just want to clarify. I thank appreciate you, that, Council. and thank you for the for the great work you're doing in uh, having these facilitating these discussions. Okay, so that's all I have. Thank with, you. With the ordinance, Eli. Yes. With the ordinances, was there just this sewer uh, ordinance, or is it just sort of ordinances in general? It was sort of ordinances in general, uh, and and again, it was sort of with the idea that that I am like they they wanted me as their liaison to be sort of feeding them very advanced information on these ordinances. I was like, I don't, I don't have, that's not how it know. works. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's some way we can sort of subdivide it into different committees. Or sort of like, if it's a zoning type issue, mm. you know, it will end up before Peter's uh, commission before it comes up. I think we're up getting a little off topic. I'll just have you know yeah. that they know our strategic plan for the next 12 months. Okay. And so they know everything and, on there. And, and I did I did share with them uh, the results of our of our strategic planning session. So, okay. And I'm always yeah. available Great. to attend their meetings as well. So you just let me know. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yes. Okay. Jim? No? No? It's on. I don't have any reports other than David and I attended a, a day-long retreat for Marine Clean Energy in Richmond, which was informative and fascinating. If anybody would like more information, I'm happy to provide it. Do we want to do anything with the PCIA letter? Nope. But you can if you'd like. Okay. Uh, then moving on the agenda, yes, Adam. Can I do one real quick report for you? Okay. Um, what is it? I just wanted to make an announcement uh, regarding the, um, there are three, in case anybody's watching, but also for your benefit, if you know of anybody, uh, Marin Housing will, will be holding a um, a lottery on October 11th for three mm. affordable housing units that are being developed down at the Enclave at 1425 Casa Buena. Those look like um, they'll be um, being wrapped up and, and being occupied by the first part of next year. But Marin Housing Authority um, is, is conducting that lottery and will be holding that on October 11th. So if anybody has wants to apply and get their applications in, the deadline is 6 p.m. on October 10th of this month, which is a week Wait, ahead. Aren't there is like household, this is if people, are they yeah. designed for people who work in public service or no? No, this is, op this is open to all who meet the income requirements. So if you recall, January 2015, the town council approved uh, the development down there, which included one unit of for um, very low income mm -hmm. uh, residents, um, uh, one for low income, and one moderate unit can, uh, income unit. Can you just remind me, Adam, what are those levels? Uh, the levels are, uh, so they're set. I'll just tell you the price that, at which they are selling, because yeah. I think that will be helpful. So the very low income unit will be sold uh, at a- No, 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 I mean, what is low income and what is it's, very low income? Right, it's, so it's, it's about, it's 50% it's of uh, AMI, uh, so Amer uh, area median income. The family, uh, the household size, for example, for a family of four is 76000 about $77,000. For the low, uh, for a family of four, and these again are three bedroom, two bath units, so they're quite large units, 94,000. And for moderate income units, actually the, it's 142,000 for a family of four. So, okay, thank you. So does the person have to be a family or could a single person? Minimum three person household um, as they define household and you get very technical in terms of how you define that. I'll leave that up to Emma, uh, Marin Housing, but. <laughs> so it has to be more than one person. Okay. Yes, absolutely. It's a minimum three person. Okay. Thank you. Um, then I think we are on to item 8.1, review of draft agenda. Any comments, questions on the draft Pauline agenda? Pauline Engelman, 110 years old. What's that? That's on the agenda for the next time. Oh. Pauline Engelman, 110. 110. It's amazing. I, I was here for her 100, I think. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, any changes? Amazing. Uh, Shouldn't look a day over Is there a committee motion to approve the agenda, that. Rebecca? For, okay. for my for my information, because um, agendas forward agendas are uh, kind of loose, and it says draft, draft, draft. Um, what is the timing, what's the appropriate timing for, let's say, the solidification of the future agenda, and how long do we have to um, potentially add something? Um, you know, actually, I can address that if you don't mind, and then, so the staff will have to comment about things like how long it takes them to get prepped, but the draft agendas were added, I don't know, I think I think I suggested this um, uh, three or four years ago because the idea was to provide a form for the five of us to say we'd like to talk about X. But since I could never know, we could never know, and it's so easy to overburden our excellent staff that, um, if David, if you wanted to hear an issue like, um, should we all sign up? What was that thing you wanted to do tonight about uh, we all sign up? Exactly. Diesel free, right? Yeah. You could say, can we put that on the agenda? And then Todd could figure out whether or not we can fit it in, and if so, when, and then that would now be something we could talk about. Yeah, I already put it on in my mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, it doesn't become a finalized agenda until about a week before the next meeting when it's actually published and made, made public, right? A few days before, right? A few business days before, right? Thursday afternoon. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, then time to go home for a journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>